sama batachi noi besama yemet nor semi kedes mangusti enta fegadi besama indionech endi hu bemedir tihun yala tenterachnen sitenzare bedalachnem ikker belen igna yebedalnen ikker endemenil awada fetna matagban kakifu adinenen fi mengist yanta entenantena Hailia Mascan. When we lose our African connection, we lose our royal connection. When we disconnect ourselves from Africa, we cease to be a world people. Without the African connection, we are a disjointed people begging for the entry into somebody else's house. Jeffrey Africa, Africa, run in Africa, ye. Aha, ye Jamaica. So what you can say, Bosu Kadia, na Andre William, and Atnasi, and what I read FM. It's Sunday, February 2, 2014. It's the first Sunday inside of Black History Month. A very, very pleasant morning to you. Welcome once again. You're inside of the Africa Forum. It's Running African. Reuniting the African family for development. Bearing witness, demanding change. Developing an African-centered agenda for change. Very, very pleasant morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the 107s, 107.1, all the way to 107.9. Good morning to you on the internet at iriafm.net. Very pleasant morning to you wherever you are in Europe, in Jamaica, on the continent of Africa, in Asia. A very pleasant morning to you. IRFM.net. Good morning. If you're joining us on your iPhone or your Android or Blackberry apps, a very, very pleasant morning to you. For those who are following us on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrea Williams G. Thank you very much for doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're at Facebook at Andrea Williams. There's also the Running African Facebook page. Please go there, like the page, and start and maintain your discussions, your Pan-African discussions. You're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African. My name is Andrea Williams, my producer, Joy Morgan. Very pleasant morning to you. Thank you, Talia Watgood. We go through until 10 o'clock. That's when the Big A comes in with the Sunday sunshine. So it's February 2. It's the second day of... Black History Month, part of what you'll be focusing on in this month, in subsequent programs, we'll be looking at identity, talking about names, what's in a name, talking about our identity, why identity is important. But for this morning, we've got an interesting program as usual lined up for you. And we've got a full 
program from beginning until. Well, as you know, the issue of Pinnacle is still in the public sphere and has been vigorously, sometimes contentiously, sometimes controversially, but vigorously discussed and debated as to the ownership of 500 acres of land at Pinnacle in the Sligoville area of St. Catherine. So that issue is still in the public domain. It's not going to go away. won't go away so easy. You can't just blink and get rid of this one. Because it has a life of its own. This morning, we're going to be talking again. We have had conversations with Helen Lee, who is a French journalist and author. The she's been at uh, married to Salif Keita and Alpha Blondie. This is something that is not very widely known, but it is there uh, in the foreword to her book. Uh, And uh, former wife of Salif Keita and Alpha Blondie. And um, as mentored, many, many uh, international artists. She is one of those persons who has been at the forefront of world music, a defender of world music, one of the first to defend world music and continues to do so. As I said before, a global journalist, one of the top journalists covering black music, first made her name writing about Bob Marley and the other reggae stars for the magazine Rock and Folk, and then branched over to cover Caribbean and African music in all its variations. And as you can see and uh, from her book that she, as, an, and as uh, David, uh, David, um, as, da- as Stephen Davis, sorry, said in the foreword to Helen Lee's book on Leonard Howell, the first master, that she didn't just write about music, she lived it. And also that she's been married to two of the great superstars of modern African music, Salif Keita and Alpha Blondie, and helped launch their careers in Europe and in America. Her first book is Rockers de Freak, uh, Rockers of Africa. And um, it still stands as a best study of African popular musicians, yet published. Also, she was a prolific journalist for the Paris daily newspaper Liberation, Liberation, where she continues to work as one of the best music journalists in any language. She has also produced superb television documentaries. As a matter of fact, she produced a television documentary entitled Leonard Howell and the Rise of Rastafarianism, the first Rasta, and that's the title also of her book, the book that we read many years ago in 2007, 2006, 2007, we read this book as part of our In Search of series, we went in search of Leonard Howell. Well, Helen Lee, in uh, doing the research for this book, actually and as you heard, became part of a story in terms of inserting herself into Pinnacle, searching for Leonard Howell from his birthplace in Redlands, in Clarendon. And um, one of the things that happened, we talked about the In Search of series, and that series uh, started in 2006. We went in search of Paul Bogle, uh, was our first uh, hero, and when I say hero, hero of the African Revolution uh, here in Jamaica, we went in search of, among those we went in search of was Paul Bogle and uh, Leonard Howell. Leonard Howell we went in search of along with the uh, Bicentenary Committee at the time and with the Nash, Jamaica National Heritage Trust. This was a partnership, our In Search of series, um, IRFM. 
and Leonard Howell was one of those persons that we went in search of. Uh, at the time, the minister, yeah, at the time, the minister of culture was Minister Oliver uh, Olivia uh, Babsy Grange, and we had many discussions with the ministry regarding Pinnacle. Uh, the Prime Minister made uh, at the time was Bruce Golding, and he made. Uh, some interesting moves because he understood the importance of Pinnacle. We still laud him for those moves. Minister Grange will be joining me on the phone lines to help to put this morning, to help to put in perspective what had already happened, what we had already achieved, and to talk about what were the plans for going ahead and also to give her own views on where we need to go now and how this should be done. She's a member of Parliament for Central St. Catherine, opposition spokesperson on youth, culture and gender affairs. And as I said, all roads are leading to Westmoreland. We're going to Belmont in Westmoreland to the home of Peter Tosh. This is where the big Peter Tosh celebration will kick off. On February 23, it's a big day. The theme this year is uh, legalize it. Looking at the relevance and Peter Tosh's relevance to the global debate, the global conversation of a legalization and in some cases a decriminalization of marijuana. Joining me on the phone line to talk about this and he's written about this is archivist, author, actor, lecturer, editor, photographer and producer Roger Stephens. So we go live to California to talk to Roger Stephens this morning about why Peter Tosh is relevant to the global campaign to legalize marijuana. Also this morning, Warrell King, who we call a memory keeper for Peter Tosh, will be joining me this morning on the phone lines from Westmoreland to talk about of zero tolerance to genital mutil to female genital is now 6.35, you're inside of the Africa Forum, Running African. All right, so uh, we're going to be going, we're going to be rebroadcasting the conversations we had with Danisha Prendergast and Maxine Stroh last Tuesday. And this was immediately after the meeting at Pinnacle. First, we'll hear from Danisha, uh, my conversation with Danisha Prendergast. Donisha Prendergast joins me on the phone lines. Donisha, good evening. Here we're um, getting uh, late breaking news about a meeting that took place this evening. Uh, or I had voice on national radio. I'm not really interested in having meetings outside of having a meeting with the Prime Minister directly because there is a great conflict of interest with the Minister of Culture who was hosting the meeting today. And so I just want to declare that we will not tolerate any false information being released on behalf of the Rastafari community. An agreement has not been made between the, Rast the St. Diego developers under the leadership of Richard Lake who will continue to destroy our heritage come sunrise tomorrow morning. The government has shown great incompetence in standing up for the rights of the Rastafari people as an indigenous people of this world. Instead, we were urged to sign a document declaring how we would approach communications with the media, which we did not sign. No, this, 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 this is a serious situation, and right, because so, so I wasn't we... present at the meeting. I'm just reading communications that, that are coming forward from representatives of the community. All right, so, so, did, so you knew about the meeting? I didn't know about the meeting. I heard about the meeting. Were you invited to the meeting? Me personally, I wasn't invited to the meeting and I, and I opted not to go because, like I said before, I'm not meeting with them. I'm right. interested in meeting with the Prime Minister to resolve this quickly. quickly. All right, so, who, so can you tell us who attended that meeting then? Members of, of, of the youth initiative represented at the meeting. There were also members of the, the Millennium Council 
who were there as well, the Leonard, Found, the Leonard Howell Foundation was not represented in, in full effect, and that is also to be noted. Um, from the government side, we had Mr. Bertrand Whiteman, who is the past Minister of Education, Bailey Harris, who is the Director of Culture, um, Deborah Hickman, Minister, Prime Minister's Assistant, Michael Lake, the Vice Chairman of the JNHT, Lisa Grant, the lawyer of the JNHT, and there were also residents from the Citizens Association. Um, one point that I have to, and let it just be said that this is the voice of the Ratafire community, right? Mm -hmm. When it was mentioned that if this case was to be highlighted by the indigenous people in America, for instance, the Cherokees or the Aborigines, the government would have made a very swift and proactive response. Yes. And in response to, to that statement, and I quote, this is not America, this is Jamaica. And we don't do things like that. that, that and this is what was said by the former Minister of Education, Bertrand Whiteman. In the meeting today. Which uh, draws us as a fire community to the conclusion that we have lost full confidence in any of the government ministers at this point. We're looking forward to meeting with the Prime Minister to resolve this because this is getting out of hand now. We're being asked to sign a document to say how we're going to communicate to the media and what must and what must, must not be said. Where is the truth? His well, majesty heard, shows that that is not the way. I heard Mr. Richard Lake on RJR this evening um, saying that it was an amicable meeting. At the end of the meeting, there was, I intimated that there was some kind of a, an agreement in terms of uh, how, how um, all parties will move forward. And he went as far as to talk about um, lots being made available uh, for, uh, in terms of ma being made a heritage, into a heritage site. So he's saying, these, as far as you know, as one of the leaders of this, granted you weren't present at the meeting, but you're saying that no documents were signed, no agreements were made? No documents were signed. This year, from what we understand, a verbal agreement was made whereby Mr. Lake said that he would not develop on the, the additional five lots that were in question. All right. Which, which should have been a natural thought process anyway, like you're not going to develop on this land because it's already been earmarked. So we're saying that you really haven't brought anything to the table that that is, is satisfactory to us. All right. So, so Danisha, this, how is this um, panning out? Because here you are as, as one of the leaders um, of a protest against what is happening and, 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 and protest for uh, justice, but you weren't at the meeting. Uh, you, you, you weren't invited to the meeting. Uh, it, it, this is sending a message to the public that they are within uh, Rastafari itself and within the response uh, to, to what's happening at Pinnacle, that there is dissent, that there is disorder, that there is disorganization? No, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Okay. I wouldn't say that because like I said, you know, I already declared that I was not going to have a meeting with anybody. And so I was not invited because I opted not to go. I see. So it's not there because that was a decision that was made within the community. All right. That was discussed. So there is no disparity within the, within the community. We stand firm on what has just been presented. But in, in, in regards to how the meeting went today, yes. to be very fair, it was an amicable meeting. There was no shouting and no disagreeing and no, no level of, of disrespect like that. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's not enough. So, so in, well, well, we'll talk to Maxine about that because she was actually there. Because one of the things you're stressing is that, listen, they, they were saying to, to persons at the meeting, um, let us know how you're going to approach media communication. Was that, is, uh, what is, what's, what's the next thing then? Because I know that there, there is, uh, you know, you have a, a wide range of, of different events that you have planned um, starting today, uh, going into tomorrow, and so on. Tell us what those are and are those still uh, on the table, are those still happening? Well, yes, we're pro proceeding with everything as, as is planned. I mean, they're not really protests, you know. They're gatherings to raise awareness because that's what we're doing in this time. We're bringing right, but, 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 this but, decision but, to Danisha, the court for let, the people. Do not let us get caught up on the words, you know, because the gatherings to, to raise awareness are for, about what? About exactly what is happening right now because if we use the word protest and someone might want to come and come with guns pointed. But when we say we're having a peaceful gathering of the family to share information, it's a different kind of communication. All right, I see what you mean. So that everything is happening just the same. Tell me what is, what's, what's going to be going, what's going to be happening as of tomorrow going ahead. Well, tomorrow we're going to continue to raise awareness 
on on school compounds across Kingston in the street. You might see us, ask us questions. It's a media day tomorrow, so we're looking forward to having the media fully support us locally and internationally. We'll have people calling in from overseas to voice their views, because the thing is that you've only been hearing from one and two leaders. Yes. But there are many other leaders internationally that, that are having their own rallying. So they're going to be calling in to be sharing what's happening over on their side of the world. And on Thursday, there's going to be a whole series of different activities showcasing the indigenous cultures of Jamaica, which is Rastafari and the Maroons. So the Maroons are coming forward and they will be bringing different artifacts, etc., to engage people. We'll also be having engagement from different human rights activists here in Jamaica. So it's going to be a very diverse and interesting experience on Thursday. All right, and this is going to be in Halfway Tree? In Halfway Tree. And you know, something that's very interesting happened to me today, Andrea. Yes. There are so many police in my space today. And every one of them, mm-hmm. instead of being disrespectful and harassing me, was genuinely interested and concerned as to how it is that they don't know who Leonard Howell is and why has his history been hidden from them. Mm-hmm. So even the same Babylonians that we're looking at yes. are saying to themselves, they were tricked. And that's what we're going to be talking about on Thursday. All right. So, so Thursday into Friday, and then what happens on Friday? Well, Friday... He, it was verbally said by Mr. Lake that he would be going up to Pinnacle to be doing some research. But it was also made very, very clear by the Jamaica National Heritage Trust that any research that is going to be done, it's going to be done exclusively by the National Heritage Trust. They really have no interest in working with the Rastafari community to the con- conduct this research, even though up until this time, I'm sure we have about mm, maybe 11 years of research on top of what you're about to start. So... So Friday, you're going to Pinnacle, the group is going to Pinnacle? You're, we'll, be there, we'll, we'll be there on Friday. We'll be there on Friday, you know, having peaceful gatherings, sharing information about what is happening. All right. Uh, and and for, for Thursday, the public is invited? All the public is invited. All right. All I'm, the public is invited. And you know what? Come out with your instruments. All your instruments and tools of trade. Please come out with the ideas, come out with the experiences. We're trying to give the government a vision of how we'd like to see our country being run. Let's have those constructive conversations and, in and, the heart of half a tree. And finally, Donisha, what is it that 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 Vastafari is asking for? What is it that, at the end of the day, um, if you could articulate in a sentence or two, that you want to see happen? Oh, it's it's very clear, you know. We want three things. There are only three things that we're asking for. Mm-hmm. We want a cease and desist order on all construction that is happening at Pinnacle immediately. Mm-hmm. We want an investigation with hired professionals outside of friend and friend business and with the consultation and approval of the Rastafari community. Mm-hmm. We have to do this investigation and research yes. in tandem. And thirdly, we are demanding a compulsory acquisition of all lands that are undeveloped, as well as all heritage sites of the lands. And, and do you know how many acres this, this would be? Yeah, they're saying it's just over 100 acres of land that is undeveloped. But at this point, they've only made national heritage a quarter lot out of 500 acres. That's how much Rasta is worth, a oh. quarter lot. Oh, and um, let me also read one more, one more quote. Mm-hmm. Um, Mr. Richard Lake is suggesting that, and I quote, what, what you are need to be doing right now is getting together the money to tell the government this is what we have and ask them how much you have. So, meaning we, under, we, 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 we understand, meaning that the only way that he's going to make this happen is if he's selling looking for the money off of it. Which we understand, you know, because he's a businessman. Mm-hmm. Like he, he told us he bought Forum Hotel for three hundred and fifty million dollars. Mm-hmm. So I understand he understands the concept of money and investment and land mm-hmm. possibilities. Right? So we're looking forward to the investigation mm-hmm. and proper research. We're looking forward to the cease and desist order. And we're also looking forward to the compulsory acquisition by the government of Jamaica. Of of about uh, just about a hundred acres of land. Let's start there, because we could be asking for a parish. We could be asking for back all 500 acres, don't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's be graceful and start. All unoccupied right. land. Let's have some conversations, because those are lands that have to be researched. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
All right. Well, so thank you for, for clearing that up, Danisha. We're going to talk with Maxine Stoner, who was at the meeting. Uh, she can give us some more insight into what happened inside of the meeting itself. But in the meantime, your word tonight is that no agreement has been reached. Everything is on the table, just as it were. People who have information about what's happening starting, uh, well, started this week, continuing into tomorrow and for the rest of the week, all of that is still on. All of that is still on. See right. you tomorrow and Thursday. Give thanks. All right. Okay, Donisha Prendergast there, as we said before, uh, developing story in the Pinnacle uh, Saga. We want to go to the phone lines now to speak with Maxine Storr of the Millennium Council. She was part of the meeting that took place today with the developers, with the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and with the Citizens Association there at, uh, at Pinnacle. And... Of course, uh, we heard earlier on on another station that some sort of agreement might have been reached. Uh, Maxine joins us now on the phone lines. Anisha Pernigas has been telling us no agreement. Everything is, is on the table as is. Uh, Maxine, thank you for joining us. Yeah, hi, Andrea. All right, so, so um, the meeting today, uh, when, when was this meeting decided on? Well, as you know, there was a earlier meeting with the office of the Prime Minister about two or three weeks ago. Yes where there was a suggestion from that meeting that we would meet on the 21st with the stakeholders mm -hmm. um, of the whole issue um, related to the um, pinnacle oh. scenario. Okay. Now, within that time, the Occupy Pinnacle um, movement was developing. As you know, it was really triggered by the court case. Mm -hmm. Um, that uh, a judgment had been um, handed down. Um, so there was this um, urgency now to actually um, come to some appreciation of the issue. Cause so, as you so, know, so, so this huh? meeting that took place today was uh, uh, directly connected to the meeting that took place before with the Prime Minister? Yes, yes, it's directly related to that. All right, because we had not heard a date of a 21st before. This is the first time I'm hearing that date because we, we had asked a question many, many times, what now? And then we were told that, oh, well, it was decided upon that we just have to plan another date. But you're saying that the date of a 21st was arranged from yes. back then? Yeah, the date of the 21st was arranged from back then. Um, yes. There was an issue with um, who might be available or not be available for that date. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then, you know, the um, Prime Minister had empaneled the team yes. on the Birchall, Ambassador Birchall Whiteman that also needed to get their, um, you know, their ducks in a row in terms of their um, their mandate to, you know, meet with the community on a variety of issues that, you know, they were actually brought in, on, onto the table based on the Carl Gardens um, um, agenda that was um, focused on with the march that you guys had done and was the focus of the University of the West Indies conference. So, so the Prime Minister had attended that conference and publicly stated that she was empaneling, you know, mm -hmm. a team of people to look on that issue. Uh, and so that the meeting today was, was held where? It was, it was held at the Ministry of Culture, but it was um, chaired by this um, um, Office of the Prime Minister team. Right, mm -hmm. so it was basically chaired by Ambassador Bertha Whiteman, Rupert Lewis, and Judy Wedderburn. All right, and mm -hmm. and and can you tell us who were present at the meeting since we're right there? Okay, it's yeah. the, the San Diego Citizen Association. Mm -hmm. um, Miss, uh, Mr. Richard Lake from the developers. Yes. Um, Lisa Grant and Aislin in Ainsley Henriquez from the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. Um, several, um, Delia Harris, the director of um, culture, culture mm -hmm. and other members, June Davis, and about two other people from um, the culture were, they were more, um, you know, observing. They weren't in the actual um, mm -hmm. uh, discussion. Right. And, and who were present from the Rastafari, uh, for the Millennium Council and the Youth Initiative? Um, who was there was the... Uh, Five members of the council, which was um, um, Sister Mitzi Williams, as Marcus Goff, myself, um, Bingy Irie Lyon, uh, Ras Bonnie Wheeler, and from the Howell Foundation, it was um, Ras Michael Barnett, and from the Youth Council, it was Sister Sanya 
and Ras Medin. All right. And give me an idea as to what format they did the conversation, the discussion um, took, and what were some of the issues raised. Well, as you know, the the Occupy Pinnacle uh, movement has been the leading voice, you know, in terms of making demands on the government Mm -hmm. and, you know, to act, right? Yes. And those demands were basically to cease and desist um, any um, construction on um, sites related to the, the land so that the research and development um, of the, to identify what were actually the monuments, etc., could proceed with clarity. Mm-hmm. And then there was also the demand that um, compulsory acquisition of um, other lands related to the, that would be satisfying to the rest of our community should also be um, achieved. Right. So those were still the basic um, points that were put on the table. Um, there were, you know, there was a agreement related to not building on the the sites that were researched already. There was about six sites, You're right? There, there was an agreement on this? On this, that no construction would be done on the six sites, even though they had not been declared. Mm-hmm. that no construction would be done on those six sites, right? Mm-hmm. And that there would be further research and development of other existing sites that may be, um, you know... Um, of cultural significance. Of cultural but, significance. But, but, and, but, but, Max, let me ask you, so there was an agreement on that also? Yes, there's an agreement so, so, to, so to do. There's an uh-huh. agreement. There's, so let me get this. There's an, there was an agreement uh, made that, uh-huh. that the developers would not... Uh, would, would cease all construction on the areas, the, 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 the uh, cultural relevant areas, such as um, the site that is designated right now. Right. And, and there are five other contiguous sites right. around that site that there would be no development on. Plus? No, and, and then there was an agreement because there was a concern about um, grave sites being, yes. you know, desecrated, mm-hmm. particularly the site with regards to um, Monty Howell's wife. Yes. And so there was an agreement that the, um, that, that would be focused on, meaning there was a um, the identification of the site, but, the, the, you know, you needed to do, you know, if you point out a site, mm-hmm. you have to now verify what you're pointing out, right? right. So, that, so that the developers, St. Jago Hill developers, they agreed on this. This agreement was made today. Yeah, they have, they have, okay. they have agreed on that. A verbal agreement. And then there's going to be future meetings now. Yes. Well, um, continuing is... meetings now to, to talk about the other land acquisition mm-hmm. and what... Just before, is... just, a mo- just before you move on, Maxine, was this a verbal agreement? Um, well, it would have to be verbal, based on the nature no, of the meeting, it could, right? signed, it could be signed off on. I, I, well, there was no signature to anything, well, okay, right? So this is a verbal agreement. It's a verbal agreement. Okay. Uh-huh. And, and it, what, what the agreement is, because um, it was in keeping, because, you know, this is a 14-year discussion, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And another seven years, certainly, since the council has been involved, right? And there has been... You know, the reason why there are six sites identified and all of these things is because there's discussions going on and movement trying to be made to reach that point. Mm-hmm. There are changes of governments, changes of boards of, you know, heritage trusts, oh, et we know, th- we know this very well because we were, right. we were an integral part of that. I'm talking about IRFM, the Jamaica National Bicentenary Committee, and the Jamaica National Heritage Trust in identifying the six lots. Uh, right. And that, and that Lisa Grant, the lawyer, had come on air and said that this, you right. know, yes, these were signed off on, this is definitely it. And then that um, as, there, was, there was something that happened that, that the, the fingers have been pointed at the Millennium Council itself in terms of the breakdown in those mm-hmm. negotiations. And this is why I am taking, I'm going step by step to ask you what the agreements were, how they were done, and so on. Be- right, right. right yes. That was discussed so, within the meeting, the, um, the flip-flopping mm-hmm. um, re- with related to the sites, the declarations that was done on the Bruce Golding, yes. the, um, the objection of the Millennium Council and why that objection um, was created and then why subsequently that objection was lifted. When it was lifted, it, it still came back to the same six sites. You know, part of the lifting was 
I think the original one was three. Mm -hmm. And then this lifting of the objection re returned it to the, the six sites, right? Yes. And the, the, the objection was also put in because we wanted some kind of uh, guarantee understanding that the sites were um, located within a, a housing development, therefore they would be restricted um, potential for development, right? It's, yes. The site is going to be governed by the housing um, stock, right? All right. So, that so there was other lands that needed to be acquired where the community could, you know, yeah. in, a, in, a, in its own scope and manner, develop something that was not restricted by the housing um, development. All right. right. So, so upon this agreement, this agreement that is being made now, and, and the mm -hmm. developers giving uh, mm -hmm. on, on this, what mm -hmm. what what did Rastafari or the Millennium Council had to give on? Was there anything that was uh, uh, mm -hmm. promised, agreed upon? On, well, on what they side? what they what they wanted to do was to there was a lot of information that was going out um, with regards to evictions of hundreds of families, and you know, yes. like a kind of hysteria, right? And there is an eviction, but the eviction is related to the um, the property mm -hmm. that is up at the top of the hill, right? Mm -hmm. There's no eviction of any other... I don't know if there's an eviction going on in the area, you know, because there's evictions going on all the while of people, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to find out and be clear, based on research that people said that several families, etc., were getting eviction notices in the area that it was not um, connected to this um, judgment. Um, Mr. Lake um, reiterated that the eviction was, or whatever was coming through the courts, was simply to the heritage site up at the top of the hill and did not, I don't know if, they, if there are people that, you know, obviously because the site has been in question, etc., different Rastafari ones have been occupying it in, And there are other people, they're not just Rastafarians living there, because we had a gentleman in studio a few Sundays ago, he was not Rastafarian, mm -hmm. um, he said he was under threat, he's been living there for many, many years, and he felt that he was one of those paying taxes who might have, uh, who was told to leave by, by the end of this month, so... Well, I don't know, I mean, that, right. th those are information now that has to come on paper, to be um, presented. No, no, but I'm not even presenting mm -hmm. information. I'm just saying, I'm just responding. No, 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 I'm just saying with the developer and with whatever is being said so that we can verify so that. Us, so let us not mm -hmm. talk on behalf of the developers then. Yeah, let yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I don't know, I don't right. know. You know. Yes. All right. So, so now I was asking about the Millennium Council and Rastafari who were gathered there. If mm -hmm. any agreement, because all right, so you're in a, a meeting and agreement was made by the developers, St. Jago Hills. They obviously have a handle. Um, uh, and, and you're in, in a negotiation. Was there any give on the part of a Millennium Council as to, okay, so you're going to do this and we're going to do this? What, what was, was there any, anything like that, any kind of reciprocity in terms of the agreement? Well, there, there, there wasn't any give because the, 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 what was on the table has been on the table, right? Mm -hmm. And what, the only thing that seemed to be emerging was lack of um, clarification on why things got... Uh, Leonard Howell Foundation and so on will be in halfway tree on Thursday. Yes, definitely, because I think that, you know, it is the pressure coming from the Occupy Pinnacle movement, right? Mm -hmm that is, you know, forcing this issue to the table. And what we made clear is that the, the pinnacle issue is one of the wider, you know, we have all these issues with the community. We still have coral gardens, we have the ganja, we have, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of other issues that are before the government for years that mm -hmm. they have not focused on, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that this team is there, the fact that this pressure and spotlight is, is not just on Pinnacle, but it's on how the government and, you know, mm -hmm. the society is dealing with the Rastafari community so at present. You, so would you say that the, the team that met with the, 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 the developers this, this afternoon and along with, with government, would you say that that team was there representing um, the, the wider interest and the widest interest possible of Rastafari and of the people of, of Pinnacle Leonard Howell Foundation and so on, that they were very well represented, that this, this representation was agreed upon, that people understood that you were talking on their behalf? 
Yes, because I, I mean, in my, in my opinion, right? These are issues I said that have been on the table for 14 years. No, ma'am, you're, you're not understanding me, Maxine. I'm just uh-huh. saying because we, it's an ongoing thing, as you've, you've, you're, you're pointing out. Uh-huh. But, but the team that met today right. with with Mr. Lake and company and yeah. with Mr. Birch and Wright Manitou, yeah, uh-huh. it was that team? Is that team uh, representative? of the widest possible interest of Rastafari, of the widest possible interest of those who are who have an interest in Pinnacle also, those who are living there who are not Rastafarians, mm-hmm. was, was that team representative, the Millennium Council representation and the representation from the Youth Initiative Youth Council, Council and the yeah. Howell Foundation. Yeah. I would say so. All right. All right, thank you very much, Maxine. So where do you go from here? What, what's the next move? Well, like I said, it is ongoing meetings. Right, and it's ongoing agitation till we reach a point of full, you know, clarity. All right. On 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 the you know full yes. objectives of and, the and culture. Wh- and while we're, while while you're on the line, Maxine, before you go, just please, I'm, I, you know, it's 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 really ludicrous that we should be the media and be begging for information. But as it is now, I have no itinerary. I don't do. I don't know what is happening, when it is happening, and who is happening. So if 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 the Millennium Council, Rastafari Youth Initiative, somebody could just send some information to Iris. FM, we would appreciate that. Yes, we, we yes. are working on that as you speak. All right. Thank you very much, Maxine. All right. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and have them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. All right, so you're inside of the Africa Forum Running Africa, and it is indeed Black History Month. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing because Black History Month, um, when we got to IRFM in the early 1990s, in 1990 actually, uh, we we heard about it, and we, were, we had com- I had conversations with people like Queen Mother Samad, um, Sister Minnie, Sister P, uh, and many others uh, in 1990, about this and and you know so we, we we in 1990 we started using the airwaves as as a place to ensure that black history month was riveted in the minds and the consciousness of the people and we've done that every year since um 1990 that is area fm ensuring that 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 is what we do um you know i think it was in 2000 well not not so long ago we had meetings with the ministry of culture about ensuring that we honor reggae artists, um, you know, who made it and, and, and who pay their dues uh, in, in no uncertain terms and who were also consciously um, doing so, doing consciously making a change. And out of that came... Discussions were already going on, by the way, for Reggae Month. And out of that came uh, Reggae Month. I know that sometimes, you know, um, sometimes you are identified as doing something, not because you are identified as doing that, but you're identified as doing so for other reasons. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to say that. All right, you're inside of the IRFM Forum, Washington, D.C., to speak with a griot percussionist who is joining us on the phone lines. Uh, He'll be here uh, for the... Celebrations of uh, Fui Sinting, and Fui Sinting, of course, is happening February 16. And in in Portland, all roads, as I said before, leading to Portland on February 16 for Fui Sinting. He was born in Dakar, Senegal, West Africa, and is the son of a great griot himself. He's well known for his proficiency and unique technique in several indigenous drum styles and rhythms and uh, he premiered his first CD a series entitled Gin Foley in 1999 in 2006 he performed and recorded with the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra and we go to the phone lines now where our very special guest is standing by and first thing we're going to ask him to do as he comes on the line, because there's a reason why we have not said his name in this segment, is that we want to ensure that while he's on, we have the correct pronunciation of his name. So I say good morning to my very special guest on the line, our dear brother from Senegal. Good morning. Good morning, my bro- everybody. My brother, I have not said your name, even though we have been saying it uh, for weeks now, well, for days now, actually. So, because I want you to help us with the correct pronunciation. 
mein Name ist Medun Yasin. Medun ist mein first name. Yes. Yasin ist mein middle name and uh, my last name is Gay. Gay. All right. And then D A M E is pronounced what? Dame or Dame? Dame. Dame. That's my nickname. I'm gay. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you very much for that. Well, I, I, I apologize because we have been doing all, all sorts of things to your name, but um, I, we, we, we were close enough. Welcome to Running African. Welcome to the Airwaves uh, here in Jamaica. And thank you very much for agreeing to be part of the Fu Sinting celebrations in Jamaica on February 16. Okay. All right, let me just first of all ask you a little bit about your father before we talk about yourself, because we hear so much about your father, who was a great, great griot himself. Tell us who your father was and a little bit about him, please. Oh, well, my father, he was a great griot, who born in 1920 in Dakar. And he was like a father of uh, my ancestor, who be like all my ancestors played drum from generation to generation to share with the society about how people can be together, how people can be remembered from the past to past to, to generation to generation to grow the young people from the next generation about understanding the transition for what Rome say. And uh, my father is the one teaching me since I born, because you're born with the real family. Rome is all over, the history is over, all over. All right. Uh, and my, yeah, my father will be playing everything, wrestling, spiritual, social. Okay, a great man indeed. Let us talk about griot. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that is used, you know, in, in, in the Pan-African circles, mainly here in Jamaica, but not, not, not well known. Uh, who is a griot? What do we mean by a griot? Uh, what that means, griot is my blood. <laughs> it's a blood. Born griot. Yes. Yeah. So when you born a griot, it's whatever I tell you about ancestor. For my all my ancestor, they a griot. Born griot that they raised in the family griot, be born and your blood is griot and you got the information and about what is the role model of the griot about the world. Mm-hmm. So 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 for, so, for so, so okay great. So what's the function of the griot? What does the griot do? The griot, what they do, for example, anything happening of life, the griot got is far from birth to death. If somebody got a ceremony of like a wedding, they call the griot. They the one sing, they the one drum, they the one organize, they the one tell you about the past, how you're going to be young and to be married to stay with your husband for long, how you're going to be blessed up, how you fix your hair, to be more pretty, to enjoy your first, like, entertainment for life with men. So, 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 the, so yes. a, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So, so the griot is, con- is constantly mm-hmm. connecting and reconnecting the future to the past and then, uh, th- then looking to, 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 um, uh, to, to the, and then within the present, making that, make it, that strand. Exactly, exactly, because the griot, our role model is to use to prepare the new generation for the future, to make them grow, to make them understand about how you go in your life and be good and do not disconnect with your ancestor. Because disconnection for your ancestor is like you don't have information about who you, what you should be doing, and how you're going tomorrow for your own future child come back tomorrow. So, 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 the, so the charge is not to disconnect from the ancestors. Um, how does one, uh, how does one remain uh, and stay connected to, to the ancestors? How does that happen? Yes, the connection to the ancestors is happening about the language of the Dromi, because the Dromi is an ancestry. Because it's gonna, it's a, it's a proverb where they're gonna be tell you, and you might be don't understand until be like the Greek will tell you, okay. This proverb is wrong to you because I might be you do something wrong and you don't supposed to do that. And we play that, that's going to make you feel like, oh, let me back up because I know what I was doing, it was wrong. So what the griot tell me, it was to don't do that because it's the wrong thing. If you doing that, you're going to mess with the society because everybody's going to try to do the same as thousands of the purpose of life. Mm-hmm. 
and so your yeah. role and, and yeah. this and, and and then the role of agree now is to is to continue to make this connection and to ensure that people do not disconnect from their from their from their ancestors and you do this through <laughs> through different means let us talk about those means well what's that mean for example my role model in america here yeah uh, i take young young kids to africa because way back it was uh, like the centralization from ancestry who people were born here and they never be in Africa and they don't never feel like how the, between Africa and America they, they, they the same people who be like come here way back before for our ancestry and they're going to get connection about the ancestor to understand really really when they come out here they got some different things they feel and they see how people end your life how people together and how how they they know they belong to Africa mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, right I, I, I understand that uh, and so how do and, and you yourself and you talk about the the, the, the work that you're doing uh, say in, in the United States and some of the some of the means open to you also are through the um, through music um, what, what other what other because I know you do music and drumming and so on how, how, to, uh, help us to understand how this works um, because you make is it songs that you make up as you as you make that connection is it poetry that you that you write uh, what what does a drum tell us uh, and so on yeah because drum drum tell a lot because for, uh, I'm teaching at high school and uh, my connection with this case is uh, to uh, make sure they understand about what are they hear from the drum what part is uh, interesting to the child to understand uh, uh, this age from the drumming what that means to be a child and to grow tomorrow and what that means, for example, you're in a school and you're never going to farming. And when you go into farming, what you think you should be doing and what encourages you to be like, you try to grow to be an uh, uh, adult because get encouraged by, by singing and music. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be something about that explains them that to their right of passage and they pass, pass through me to start growing start dancing, start feeling some step they never see in their life, some mm-hmm. song they never heard, and some rhythm they never heard. And that's going to be challenge their body transition to understand how they start doing the thing and understand mm-hmm. what the rhythm says. What, what is the major channel, cha- challenge you face with uh, uh, us Africans who um, are in the diaspora uh, in terms of that reconnection to, 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 to our ancestors, reconnection uh, to Africa? Because you, 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 you have done a lot of work on this side uh, of, of the Atlantic. Uh, what do you find as a major challenge in helping us to reconnect to our ancestors? I find out like we got the same ancestry because uh, I start with like uh, uh, teaching people who today you see them playing African drum, you will be like, oh, they are just coming from Africa or they just uh, got the right information they should be have. And that's the that's way I connect to be like all over the United States. I'm all over. I'm, mm-hmm. Any conference you go on, who you see my name, I'm over there doing lecture, teach them. The right bit because right now the challenge of African music is kind of a little bit changing because people don't have the right teacher and they don't connect to for the ancestry about what should be doing mm-hmm. because uh, the video got a lot of information. It's just like at one level where you never be open to going over there study. You're going to be stuck there like you don't have mm-hmm. the right information. Mm-hmm. Where do you keep all this information in your head? Uh, in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I take it that you're passing. In my head. So are you passing it on then yes. to, to the next Grio in line? I can't hear you. Uh, are you passing this on to the next Grio in line? Oh, I, I already got something in line about my music. I'm preparing for, for real for my documentary because from last 10 years I was doing touring. 
Oh, no, 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 you, you, misunderstood. you misunderstood. I was talking about, um, so you have the information in your head, and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and how, do, how does the next generation of griot within the gay family uh, get this information, since it's in your head? Uh, have you passed this on to your son or to your daughter, uh, others in the family? Oh. Understanding, yes. Okay, and yes. I, I, I got you because uh, we born raised in a, a big family. Yes. We don't mostly be like uh, moving around when we grown from age eighteen. We still stay in the family, stay in the family, and keep learning for yeah. our, our parents. And that's the way we grow and pass through the generation to generation the same knowledge. Yes. Like like right now, my son is in England teaching drum. He's still been connected with me to learn how to do lecture, whatever he says, like for Apple. Mm -hmm. I got this thing, I hear you was playing this. What's that mean? Yes. And I'm going to explain. What's that mean? Yes. How far, but how for, for far? For example, I'm, Yes, I'm, go, go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm going to give you an example from the role model of the, the Grio from the society. How Grio is very important for the society to, for example, somebody got beat by a snake and you know, the, 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 the snake is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, if the griot is already where it's drum, it can handle it one song it's going to play to the drum, and uh, the venom is going to hurt the heart or the, 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 the brain to kill that, enter the helicopter. And that rhythm is named Kujan Mat. Kujan, Kujan Mat, some held them today, when they do that, when they do yet, some held them today. Okay. Longer you play that, yes. that person is safe. Okay. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. We're really looking forward to seeing you to seeing you at Fuwe Sinting. That's very, very interesting. All right. So, so how, far back, how far back does it, the knowledge go, the information that's in your head? How far back do you go? Mm -hmm. How far I'm going is like uh, I was born in 1954. Yeah. I'm ready next April. I'm going to be 60. So yeah. I've been a long time sitting with my father, my uncle, my ancestors right. to learn a lot about spirituality, about the social, about mm -hmm. a lot. It's a lot. So, so do you also learn about the, and teach about the beginning, uh, you know, where, where, where we came from, who we were, that very first, you know, time, uh, those old times, those ancient times? Yeah, the biggest way we're coming from way back is we're coming from Egypt to the Nile. We're coming from, and, uh, e we're coming from e sorry, you said we're Egypt. coming from Egypt? The Egypt, yeah, the yes. Nile. Oh. And uh, you know, that time it's not a transportation. What they do is they're flowing in the river and going to cross to the beach and going down to the first station they were coming for, as I said, it's named Sumbeju. So, say that again? Sumbe June. Sumbe June. Sumbe June. Yes. Yeah, that's why it's in the coast of the West uh, in Senegal. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they are, uh, they saw being understand about dealing with the spirituality and connect from the spirit of that is named the Tao, who was playing by my ancestor way back, way back. I can say, I don't know how many thousand Centuries, years. Centuries, yes. And that's the way we understand they come by terrace and going down to, to go on ground to uh, ground on Uganda, Kenya, and the other side and the west is Wakam and York where the fishing people, fishmen start like learning fishing. Mm -hmm. so For example, you go into Uganda, you see them with the uh, uh, three signs of the mark in their face. Yes. And you go to Wakam and Angor, they got those three sides of the market in their face. Mm -hmm. That's me related spiritually about how Africa is built way back. It was like that. Mm -hmm. That's the way black people coming from yes. and spread out everywhere yes. you think about. Because people think everybody come from, everybody coming from just slavery. No. 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 They are in this land for a long time before all those things happen. 
Oh, we are we are so. Can I may I just say that we're so looking forward to seeing you at Fuwisinting. So, so, so the stories, um, the, the 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 stories of ourselves that we told in Africa that your father told you and his father and his father and his father before him about the beginning of 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 time and and, and who we were and where we came from, uh, started with Egypt and and coming across the River Nile and 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 making making our way across the continent of Africa. That's a story that has been told uh, to the griots on the continent of Africa before the, the white man came. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's the way because we remember Africa, any king in Africa, you got your right hand griot because the griot being be like the role model for the griot. It was Ankara, the king, wake them up with a nice song, sing for them, go on with them the world and come back and tell history. Mm-hmm. What's happening with the world? Yes. Who was the who was the the, 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 the the real man in the world and that's the was the role model for the grill. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't stay home. They go into the war, mm-hmm. fight and come back. Mm-hmm. Way back. All right. To tell, to tell history. All right, with, with just a few minutes to go, um uh Mejun, can you give us an I sing a song for us um that a griot might sing, something that we might hear or recite a poem, anyone that that you're more comfortable with, even if you have a drum with you just to play a few notes there. So we get an idea of what you know to expect when you come to Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Are you able to do that now? Okay. I can I can I can do that right now because I think that if you got minutes, I got my drum a little bit here. All right. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So a griot always has his drum. A griot percussionist always has his drum okay, nearby. Okay, you're gonna have look this one. Yes. All right. So. Um, okay. Yes, you go right ahead as soon as you're ready. Oh yeah, we got lots of rhythm being tell history and everything because that's the way we born um, in uh, like. Uh, Song for the young generation, song for the elders, right. and everything is like, oh, for example, the way my ancestor is very close. They, the little people, mm-hmm. the little people, they sing, and it's a one song they will sing. Mm-hmm. And that's them, now Rabin. Oh, wow. You know, we're all roads are leading to Somerset Falls in Portland on the 16th. Sister P's going to need a big stage, a very, very big stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dabe uh, uh, okay. We really appreciate your coming on. Yeah. yeah it's going to be my second time. Jamaica, because I came to Jamaica with the National Ballet of Senegal in 1990. Oh, goodness, in 1990. What month was that? Uh, it was, we stay in the Pegasus Hotel. Yes, that is ringing a bell. Yeah, that is uh, ringing it, a bell. Yeah, <laughs> we, so I visited the Bob Marley Museum. Uh, I was over there doing uh, the show inside the the Pegasus, and yes. that was my best. That's well, I, I well, love Jamaica. Oh, well, Jamaica has changed so much, but you're going to love Portland even more. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We look forward to seeing you on the 16th. We'll be there ourselves. I'll make sure that I come and introduce myself. And we're expecting mm-hmm. great things uh, in Portland. Thank you very much, uh, Major Onyesi. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, man. Thanks. All right. So that's uh, Major Onyesi in uh, Gay, gay is, the name is pronounced gay, but it's spelled G U E Y E. And he'll be here at Fuwisinting, 16th of February 2014, Somerset Falls, Hope Bay in Portland, Jamaica. He'll be here. You know, I, in this Black History Month, to hear a, a griot from Dakar, Senegal, whose father before him was also a griot, a great man, and whose father before him, because he says, it's in the blood, it's how it is, you know. Tell us of the stories that were told uh, to to them long before the Europeans raided and raped the continent of Africa. The stories that the Europeans want us not to know. The story that's not necessarily in our history book. The story of ourselves. History of ourselves. Of who we are. Of where we came from. And so when we reclaim our identity. Identity is something we're going to be talking about. When we reclaim our identity. We must understand 
what we're reclaiming, who we are, who we were as a people. And as Medun just said, we, our history did not start with slavery. Slavery is an interruption, a terrible, wicked, cruel, and dastardly interruption, but an interruption nonetheless to the history of a great people, of those of us who stayed in Egypt, of those who crossed the River Nile and spread out across the continent of Africa. That's who we are. And as we reclaim our identity, we must understand exactly where we're coming from. Great builders of pyramids, great builders of temples and, 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 and uh, masons, uh, you know, this whole idea of the Freemason and all of that. That's where all of this is coming from, you know. Uh, architects uh, and so on, um, medical doctors, everything started with us. And this is where we must send Kofa to, to go back to the past, to reclaim that which we have lost. Black power, black power, black power, black power, black power, black power, reclaiming our identity. He said, I am as old as the sun from the earth was, reincarnated millions of times and still doing the same work musically. And I don't want to be looked upon as no superstar, as no king. My music is just music. It's a message decorated with music for the awakening of a people's consciousness onto certain levels of reality. He understood himself. He understood himself. A man of the past, living in the present, stepping in the future. Understand ourselves from the river Nile, from ancient Egypt, from Luxor. All right, we're back with you inside of the IRFM Forum, Running African. Going to be going to the phone lines now to Paris, France, where journalist Helen Lee, our French journalist specializing in Jamaican and West African music, started as a journalist in 1979 for Liberation Magazine, and a news, daily news, that is, and was one of the first to defend world music in France. Her early works on African artists helped establish artists like Salif Keita, Alpha Blonde, Ray Lima, and she has published different books related to the Jamaican and culture contributing to the development of the reggae music in France and is considered an expert on the Rastafarian culture. So Helen Lee joins me from Paris this morning. Hello. Helen, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to Running African once again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Right, it's been quite a while. Uh, may I just say, Helen, that I've read your book, The First Rasta, Leonard Howell and the Rise of Rastafarianism, about four times, and I'm not lying. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it is an honest truth. Uh, uh, yes. Next time we meet, uh, you have to tell me all the mistakes I probably made. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, Stephen, Stephen Davis... I think he did. Yes. Uh, he did a pretty good job of of ensuring that that you had it. And and I see you spoke also with Miguel Lorne as as one of the source um, sources for for the book. And and the research that went into this book, though, I want to start there, Helen, because your research was so different in terms of how you did it, uh, immersing yourself in in the Jamaican uh, culture and the Jamaican society to get this information. Talk to us a little bit about how you garnered, how you gathered the information for this book, The First Rasta? Well, um, it took a long time. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been always fascinated by uh, the popular culture of Jamaica, folk culture of Jamaica. And um, I love to be in the villages, in the hills, and listen to the old people talk. And this is how, little by little, I got into this, uh, not just the Rasta thing, but just general culture of Jamaica. So, um, and also I'm a bit... Uh, uh, clumsy and not, uh, very <laughs> you know, I'm not very good uh, in society. And also, um, I realized that in Jamaica at that time, which is at the end of the 70s, um, a white girl uh, interested in Rasta, it could be only something like sex or something, and mm -hmm. um, they couldn't take me seriously anywhere, even at the university or in those places where they're supposed to be interested in history or in Jamaican history. I realized that I was not really welcome, except with a few people who really helped me, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I, I just stuck with the people and I thought they are the ones who made it. They are, are the ones who invented that culture and uh, uh, created the Rasta movement. So 
I, it was a pleasure and it was a necessity and uh, the result is the book. <laughs> right, and, and, and let me just congratulate you once again on, on the book because as it stands now, it is um, one of the only, I think um, Robert Hill um, has, has, has um, also written, but, but the, the books on Leonard Howell are few, are few, and I know only of two. I don't know if you know any more, and that's yours and, and Robert Hill's. Uh, so, so that the work that you did, now we're returning to that as, as, as you know, documentary evidence for what is unfolding now in Jamaica in search, in, I mean, in terms of um, the situation at Pinnacle. I have told you about the, yes. back, uh, the background situation to Pinnacle. Uh, Pin Leonard Howell interested you why? Why were you driven to, to research Leonard Howell and ultimately Pinnacle? Um, Perry Hensel, as you know, was living just across the, the, the road, uh, across the gully, uh, at, uh, on the other side of Pinnacle at Caymanas. And he's the one who uh, once showed me the hill and said that Pinnacle was there in the old days. And I was so surprised because it was a legend for me, but I didn't even even think that it, it exists, you know, it's yes. like those legends. Yes. And um, so I decided to go and try to see how it looked like. Mm -hmm. And um, I, went, I went up um, asking people, hitchhiking, going right and left, until I found somebody who knew more or less where it was. But uh, I, in those days, it was completely forgotten. So I had to ask uh, a gentleman who was um, the caretaker of, um, of the new owner and who had to open a, a way for me up the hill with his machete. Um, um, it, it was totally forgotten. Uh, there were bush all over the place. It was not even possible to... Um, even the, the, the old paths were covered with the uh, brush and... Uh, uh, and, so and, and what year? It, what year was this? That was uh, eighty-three, maybe eighty-three, right. something like that. that so the, everybody had given up on it. Yes. All right. So, uh, but you you went through and and you trekked through Pinnacle, and uh, and at the end of the day, the information there is is invaluable. Well, I want to talk to you about your research because you didn't just go to Pinnacle. You also went to. Um, the different, you went to the archives, you went to the Institute of Jamaica, as you said, you went to the University of the West Indies, you spoke with persons like Mortimer Plano, and also um, the interviews you did with uh, Leonard Howell's children, invaluable in the book, and, and, and with persons who were there living at, at Pinnacle at the time uh, of um, when Leonard Howell was there. Uh, let us talk about that. Uh, Okay. What, what let, and, and that research, I think, is, is, is great. But let us talk somewhat about the... Because here in Jamaica, the, the contention now is ownership of Pinnacle. You have done some research on that as to the, how the land was acquired. And I want you to help us to share, sh by sharing that research with us. It's also in the book, people, by the way. It's called First Rasta, Leonard yes. Howell, and the rise of Rasta Furnace. Um, it, uh, it is a strange story because uh, Leonard Howell didn't buy it himself. It's, it is the, uh, Albert Chang, who was at the, the big man in the Chinese community, who I think he liked Howell, and he understood what was his dream, and he tried to help him uh, to put people to work in this um, old domain. So he, 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 bought, he bought a pinnacle and uh, gave it to Howell. Howell uh, paid half of the money in advance, and uh, I don't know how what happened with the other half. And uh, of course, Pinnacle people say that uh, the whole Hoylites say that the whole money was paid, and I think it was because uh, at the at uh, the end of Pinnacle there was a lot of money up there. So it's not a question of a few hundred uh, pounds that could have made a big difference. So um, I think it had been paid at least um, a good part so but howell didn't take time to register the the, the domain in his in his name so um, he was that kind of person 
person. His, mm-hmm. his son says that all the time he had problems like that. He would buy something, but he wouldn't do the proper papers. And so uh, <laughs> uh, in the end, somebody else would pick up the car or the house or whatever. And this is what happened with, uh, with Pinnacle, I recall. So uh, when the, what happened exactly uh, when uh, Chang died um, is that uh, uh, it was a very bad time for Howell. His wife had committed suicide, and um, of course, all his uh, enemies were telling everybody that uh, he had killed his wife, which is which is not true, and which has been proved by all the witnesses not to be true. So, um, but it is true that in those big uh, people uh, houses, there were gossips about this man who had killed his wife and so on. And Chang suddenly, Albert Chang probably uh, felt responsible for uh, helping somebody who in the end um, uh, was, a, was a murderer. So he was very old and he was going, he, he knew he was going to die. In fact, he died two months after writing his, um, his will. And uh, he said in his will that uh, he, he wanted to give a pinnacle to, if he couldn't sell it before he died, he would give pinnacle to the Boy Scouts. All right. And so this, so, is, this is Albert Chang that we're talking about. I just want to back up a bit, uh, um, Helene, and if you could speak just a little bit slower um, so that, uh, uh, because of your accent. And I think I have to do the same thing for, <laughs> for you. So I want to back up a bit to say that um, you, your research showed that Chang um, purchased the land um, for Leonard Howell, that he paid half of the money and, 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 and probably did not register the land. But you, your research, from your research, you're also uh, extrapolating that he paid all of the money because of the amount of money that was coming into Pinnacle and the relationship that these two had. So it might have been cash that was just handed straight to Chang and the land was, and the land was paid off, but that it was never registered in Leonard Howell's yes, name. Yes, and yes. That, and that yes, would explain... That's what, uh, yes, go ahead. No, uh, probably he paid the money because money was not his problem. Uh, Leonard Howell uh, in those days was uh, uh, at the head of a big ganja plantation and uh, there were trucks, uh, truckloads of ganja uh, leaving directly to the States from his place and uh, um, he, he was not lacking money. So I don't think he would have put his whole community in uh, jeopardy just for a few hundred um, pounds. So I do believe that he paid the money. But the, the thing is more that this friendship between him and, uh, and uh, Chang uh, little by little deteriorated over the years. And, um, and, and Chang uh, finally decided that um, he, he couldn't uh, put up with him anymore. So um, this is for sure. Uh, um, but who, when the money was paid and why it was not registered, uh, I can only guess. How did, how did Howell come to be so close friends with Chang? Do you know how they met? Uh, probably through his wife, because uh, uh, Chang and Howell met when uh, Howell uh, went, uh, came out of uh, jail uh, at the end of uh, the 30s. Uh, but it is sure that uh, Chang, um, Howell had, uh, in those days was very, uh, was seen in a very positive way by big people like the leader of the Chinese, Chang, the leader of uh, um, the Indians, uh, Baba Tuwari, um, and, and uh, one big, uh, one big, big um, rising uh, leader of the um, Lebanese community, uh, uh, Edouard Hanna, who was uh, 
who also helped him a lot. So it's funny to see that in those days, Howell appeared like a possible leader for the total uh, black population of Jamaica, somebody who would take care of the sons of slaves, give them uh, land to work and put them to work and, and, and uh, build Jamaica with their strength, like the Chinese were doing, like the Indians were doing, like, um, like the Lebanese were doing. They were um, recent immigrants. Uh, Howell was uh, 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 just had, had just uh, come back from the States. He had been traveling too. And it was part of this great movement of rebuilding Jamaica after the colonial, um, uh, the colonial period. And so I believe that uh, Howell, uh, he, if he had not been dealing in ganja and, and um, linked to all kinds of uh, strange businesses because of ganja, he would have been uh, a political leader of great strength. Mm-hmm. All right. And then, so, and, and we're going to come back uh, to, to these um, leaders of the different communities that you mentioned, including Edward Hanna. Um, so, so, so that uh, Chang, you, you, you mentioned, God um, was getting old, knew that he was, uh, you know, his time was, was near, and he made a will. Yes. And, and what did this will say? Um... um I, I was trying to find it in my computer. I'm really sorry. I just uh, quote you by memory because I couldn't find it exactly. But yes. it says, um, concerning Pinnacle, I'm trying to sell it now. But if I do not manage to sell it, I want it to be transferred, the property to be transferred to the Boy Scout, Scouts. And uh, I know that Chang has been linked to the Boy Scouts and to uh, some uh, gymnastic uh, uh, sports societies. And so uh, probably he was just trying to, uh, he didn't want to give to his uh, children the, this, bad, um, this bad problem of uh, a whole community living there, mm-hmm. thousands of people that they, they would have to throw out, and also the ganja problem, and uh, probably he knew also more about what was going on there than, uh, than uh, most people knew, and he knew that there were some big politicians who were dealing in ganja over there. So I think he just wanted to get rid of that, and he didn't want his children uh, to be linked with this... Um, shady businesses Mm -hmm. and also uh, at the end of his um, his will he says that it's just a note but he says that whoever of his descendants of his children and grandchildren would marry uh, out of the Chinese community would be uh, this um, disinherited yes disinherited wow so I think he he had he had a bad bad uh, shock because of uh, Howell's uh, wife's death. Um, Especially Howell's wife had some Chinese blood, I believe. Mm. All right. So so that who, so so it was willed to the Boy Scout. And and from the Boy Scout, where did it go? That's that's when it becomes very strange. Because uh, if you go to the registrar, um, you notice that uh, um, it's uh, it, it's supposed to be reversed to um, to the crown or to to the country because um, uh, it doesn't have a new owner until uh, two years later in uh, in 47 when suddenly um, it is transferred to Edward Rashid Hanna. And Honan Fletcher, who I think was a lawyer, was his lawyer. So it's, in fact, it's in, uh, after Chang uh, gave it to the Boy Scouts, who knows why, suddenly it's in the hands of Edward, uh, Edward Hanna. And who, who, and, who, 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 is, who is Edward, who's Edward Hanna? Because we've been speculating that, that he might be related to our current Minister of Culture. Any ideas? 
I'm not sure about that. What I know, it's it's the same family. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Edward Hanna in those days was, was a young businessman, extremely active, intelligent, and uh, he he was like Howell, um, uh, very fond of simple people. He wanted to put them to work, give them a, way, a, mean, a means of living. Uh, he, he was a man with dreams and also uh, a very, very a powerful, um, uh, how, how do you say, entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he had really a sense of enterprise, and um, so he had different all kind. He, he's the same family. We still have the the supermarket on uh, on parade. Uh, he no, he had a lot of. Uh, different mm-hmm. businesses. He had also uh, some furniture, a furniture company. He was building furniture. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I believe he was uh, the model uh, or partially the model for um, um, the Lebanese uh, merchant in, um, in uh, Power Game, Perry Hensel book. Oh, um, how do they come? The how do so, they come? No, not the harder they come, but his book uh, called okay. Power Game. Yes, or oh, Power um, Game, yes, yes. Power Game. He yes. had he had this um, uh, Lebanese merchant who um, who makes uh, furniture and he 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 makes he sends containers to Miami, but just before putting them on the ship, he empties all the furniture in the hills in the gullies and uh, put ganja, fill them with ganja instead, and, uh, and they go with uh, the uh, police protection to the harbor, and, uh, and how, that's how he was doing his business. I don't know if this is the real story, but that's the way uh, Perry Hensel tells it. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so Edward Hanna was um, this powerful Lebanese businessman, and along with Fletcher, who then, by some mysterious means, seemed to have acquired a pinnacle. But it was not willed to them. It was willed first to the Boy Scout, and that's interesting. Exactly. and yes. that, Exactly. And the register says, uh, will of Albert Chang deceased. That's exactly what it says. But the will doesn't speak about Hannah and, uh, and Fletcher at all. So um, I think that's where the shady business started. And um, probably, um, I'm not in Jamaica now, so I'm not able to follow all the all the details of the um, trial and so on, but I'm sure the judge had a hard time finding the, uh, finding the, um, the, the proper uh, papers to, to link this Chang uh, uh, don- um, uh, will to uh, today's, uh, today's owners. owners because yes. I, I wondered if, if, if they went there. I, I did not hear of that at all. I, I think, you know, for whatever reason, it just went to where it went. But um, so that, so, so, so help us to understand how, how, it, how the land now um, is in this situation that it's in. So it's moved from, from, from the Boy Scout, from, Ch- from well, it's Howell's land. Somehow, and, and you said in your book that the betrayal of Leonard Howell in terms of Pinnacle happened with Chan. You're saying, you, you use the word betrayal. You said uh, Howell was betrayed by Chan in terms of how the land was willed. Yes, uh, but you know, it's, I, I cannot really uh, decide what happened because um, those are old things. And I, went, I tried to ask questions to the Chang family, but I couldn't get any answer. They, they don't want uh, to, to, go, to, do, <laughs> to be linked to this uh, problem. Yes. So I couldn't, I couldn't know much. But what I know is that uh, Chang did helped Howell a lot for many years. He was really behind the community uh, and, uh, and uh, all his life, in fa- uh, all the time that uh, uh, Howell was uh, linked with uh, Chang, um, they, 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 they had really nice uh, relationship, I, be- I believe, mm-hmm. until, uh, he, until uh, Howell's wife's death. And yes. that's when 
everybody, and even now, uh, I remember some Jamaican friends who were really uh, interested in history, and when I told them that, in fact, uh, Howell had nothing to do with the murder and that the police had to release him and so on, um, uh, or the mur murder, no, in fact, it was a suicide, yes. uh, I remember that the, the people in Jamaica were so surprised that he, he didn't kill his wife because... Until now, the rumor has been there that he had killed his wife, which oh, is totally yes. false. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. part of all the, those horrible things that have been said on the Rastas and mm -hmm. are still going on like that. Uh, Even today. Uh, oh, Helen, can you hold the line for me? Let me take a quick break and come right back. Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, French journalist and author Helen Lee is on the phone lines. She's the author of the book, The First Rasta, Leonard Howell and the Rise of Rastafarianism, and uh, has done uh, some serious research looking at Pinnacle. We're talking about ownership of Pinnacle and how Pinnacle, um, uh, you know, has gotten out to the point where there's this contention over ownership. Uh, Helen, let us go uh, to the point of, of, of um, Hannah and Fletcher. Um, did they then sell the land, and to whom? Um, uh, where, whom they, did they sell the land to? Um, uh, I have to check. I don't remember exactly. What I know is uh, that um, they got rid of... Uh, I think got rid of the land because uh, there was not much to be done there, mm -hmm. and finally uh, they sold it to one man, or or it ended up in the hands of um, mm -hmm. uh, this man Watt, who was a bigger. Um, he was he's, he was a builder, and he needed the stones. He so he. he He's the one who bought Pinnacle, and he had nothing to do either with the Rastas or with the Ganja. Uh, he was a very straight and religious man from uh, Scotland, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, and and with it, uh, the whole place disappeared. That's his son who burned the village, and uh, and destroyed and re destroyed Pinnacle. All right, so it, it went into the hand of what? I think it was the Linton Water, it was his name. And then and, and it, the, the, the land was burnt, you see, yes. it, was, it was his son who did that. Uh, full disclosure yes. is that for, someone's, for some strange reason, you know, I find my family name in the middle of all of this. Um, what, by the way? <laughs> so full disclosure and... Um, just, just reading where you said that you found them and so on, um, they we've always known of, about the, about that. <laughs> All right, we'll talk. Yeah. We'll, talk uh. we'll talk about that another time. But um, so, so, so that uh, from so, so what acquired it, uh, and you're not quite sure how what acquired it, um, but but they somehow got no, it from, from it. Hannah. Sorry. Yeah, they, yes. they got it from Hannah and Fletcher by some in, by some means. Yes. Uh, and, and then what? And, and why, why are we not sure? Couldn't you find a, a, a title in your research or at regist the registrar, I mean, how they got it? Um, uh, uh, I could, yeah, I could go back to the, the papers okay. if you give me a minute, but... Uh, um, <sighs> All right, that's okay, Let Helen. We, we, we'll, we'll come back to that another time. Let us look, look at our ownership um, past from, from, from what to who? Uh, after what, um, it, was, uh, it, it went through uh, different ownerships, but they, uh, finally it was uh, bought by uh, Mr. Lake and uh, Miss, uh, um, Miss, um, the, the actual owner, Sherwood. Uh, Miss Lloyd Sherwood, yes. who, who was a very nice person and who just uh, um, bought it uh, with her husband, I think, who was uh, from the States, and uh, who wanted to set up a, um, a nice uh, 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 living area of, over there. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a lot of problems to do it because there was no water at all. Yes. Uh, it was very dry. And... Um, she, 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 she 
she just didn't know it was uh, what it was. It, she didn't know right, that because was you, you, because in your book um, you 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 write about your meeting with her and and yes. what and what she told you um, once. And this was and this this was in, uh, information you were gathering in it was in the seventies that you were gathering this information. No, in the eighties that yes. you were gathering. And, and so beginning of the eighties. Yes. Right. And then at that time, what did what did Lois Shaw would tell you about uh, acquiring the land? And, and, and about discovering that, the historical significance? I think it's uh, her son, uh, like, trying to erase the whole story. Mm. So when he, they discovered what it was, they thought it would be nice to do something about it and, uh, and uh, keep some, at least the top part where the old house was, uh, to uh, as a memory to the Rasta movement, and they were very open to to the whole idea. But uh, what happened is that um, in later years, while they were trying to set up uh, the 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 um, uh, how do you say the, de- um, the development. Uh, uh, lo- the development, yes. Mm. Um, the people who started uh, buying place, buying uh, plots and uh, building houses, uh, they didn't. They were not too happy to see that some Rasta started coming up there. Mm. Very few, but um, the, 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 that's when also we started uh, talking about Pinacol and trying to. Um, make some kind of uh, uh, homage to this uh, this beautiful story, this um, pinnacle yes. story. Yes. So people started coming, visiting, and there were Rastas uh, who st- even lived, uh, went to cleaned up the whole top and uh, and and started living in in the ruins. Yes. And while doing so, uh, of course the. They also destroyed things, and they, they, you know, it was an old, very old house in a very bad, uh, bad uh, state. So when you, once they cut the trees and the bush that were growing on top of it, the stones started falling down, and so suddenly the the place didn't look at at all the same. And those Rastas who were up there, they were not Hoelites. The Hoelites were living at uh, um, Pinnacle, at um, Tredgar Park under Pinnacle, yes. but they were not the ones who started uh, capturing Pinnacle. Right. They were but, different but, people. But they, but they understood that this is where the great movement um, was fostered in terms of, of Leonard Howell being the first, the first raster. So that is for, it. for them, it was that a pilgrimage. Um, to, 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 to a kind of a mecca is, is what is what Pinnacle exactly. was, was for many of us. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, oh, exactly. And, and, and it was very important. And um, they realized that it, it must be made a national monument. Yes. And, uh, and, and even in those days, I went there and uh, they told me that they were, uh, they were ready to do it if um, there was not further complication. But now, apparently, it's... It's yeah. grown to a different dimension. <laughs> there, there is, there is, there, there is a, a, a movement um, here in Jamaica, um, the Occupy Pinnacle movement, and there are many Jamaicans, Howellites and, and Pan-Africanists and Rastafarians and so many others who feel that an injustice has been done at some point. As, as your book, uh, you know, alludes to throughout the book in terms of the land itself and where that happened and, and where the compromise should be made and how that can be made. So there is that ongoing discussion right now in Jamaica, out of this, as my brother Jerry Small said on his radio program the other day, out of conflict can only come, um, you know, resolution, and we'll see what the resolution is. So the conflict in itself that is ongoing right now, I think is brilliant, because in a way it is also shedding light on Leonard Howell, um, the first raster. Yes. We, we are not heard much about in the, in, in, the, in the public sphere in Jamaica, in academia, or anywhere else. You point out, for example, in the book that in your research, you were surprised that the Rastafari, the report on Rastafari, the, I think it was the, Net, the, the, the um, Nettleford and so on, report of the 1960s, that this report did not include that Leonard Howell was alive at the time of the report, obviously, but that they had not interviewed him and, and just dismissed him as being, you know, dead or in prison. Yes, yes, 
appreciate that. This, uh, this is why it's very interesting to see that uh, Professor Hill now is coming up with uh, some new explanations about how the whole thing happened. Anyway, uh, I have to say Professor Hill is the, is the person who um, gave me the idea of really looking into Howell's story. It's him who opened the doors for me because yes. the research he's done before me, long before me, yes. uh, was really magnificent. It's yes. only 20 pages or 15 pages, but it's, it's wonderful. I, I have to give him uh, respect for that. Right, and we want to talk to him also. Um, uh, we're trying to get him actually uh, for next program to talk about that. But um, Helen, uh, you know, what you have done is help us to shed some light because the research that, that you did in, in trying to get to, uh, to find Leonard Howell, the, the first raster, um, actually uncovered so much in regards to Pinnacle, um, the documents you found. Um, you have the will, um, a copy of the will in your possession um, from Edward Chang and so on. So that, that is helping to shed some light on the conversation as we go forward. So, so finally, um, in, your, in your own mind, because you immersed yourself in this, and I, I know that you could not have come away not, not actually feeling something. I sense a sadness that you felt at different times and so on. Um, uh, yeah. in, in your own mind, how do you, uh, what, what are your thoughts on what should happen to Pinnacle? And I know that you, you're conscious of who owns it now and all of that, but, but in your own mind. Um, do you think Rastafari has a claim on this land in terms of it being the Mecca, uh, in terms of Howell being uh, probably robbed of the land? What are your, what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, I'm a bit embarrassed to answer this question because uh, um, I don't claim to be a Rasta, although I learned a lot from those people. And, uh, of course, it's, it's such an important movement. It has millions of uh, adepts all over the world. And even who people who are not adepts like me are really people who, uh, who respect this culture and, and uh, find a lot of uh, food for thought in it. And uh, so um, I'm really glad that uh, there is a movement now to do something about Pinaco and hopefully make it a national monument or whatever so that people from all over the world can go and visit. Um, that would be great. But... Um, if it's going to be just a fight between brothers to know who's going to get it and what business they're going to set up and make, make out of it some kind of uh, nine miles uh, uh, phenomenon with a, with a huge uh, uh, barriers all around that you cannot come and pray. I think it should be a totally free place with nothing just for people to come and pray or, you know, like uh, yes. some kind of... Uh, uh, the wall of uh, lamentations or something like that, a place to think, not a place to fight, yes. not a place to do business, just a place to think, chant, and, um, and think about the future of this world because that's what uh, Howell was dealing with. All right. Thank you very much, Helen Lee. Appreciate uh, your input this morning in this ongoing debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> Have a good day. All Bye. right. Okay. Uh, Helen Lee, author of the first Rasta, Leonard Howell, and the rise of Rastafarianism. As he said before, uh, a, a French journalist, a celebrated French journalist and um, author, and um, she was once married. I know it has no bearing on this, but many people didn't know that, to Salif Keita. She was also married at one time to... Alpha Blonde, uh, one of a top French journalists covering black music. She first made her name writing about Bob Marley and the other reggae stars for the magazine Rock and Folk. And then she branched over to cover Caribbean and African music in all its variations. All right, but a prolific uh, writer and a celebrated journalist who did some research, serious research here on Leonard Howell. A lot of what we know about Leonard Howell we know because of her research. All right. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with Louis Moister. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? I am doing very well. And you? Well, good, good. Yes. All right, Louis, you know, I keep going back to 2007 when we went in search of Leonard Howell and yes. the amount of information that we gleaned because of the research that you had done and still continue to do on Leonard Howell. And that is why your voice in this conversation is indispensable. We have to hear from you because you've done so much work in this area. 
Um, so, so, so the land is in dispute. Ownership of the land is, is in dispute. Last time we spoke, one of the things you said is that we, there's no title showing that Leonard Howell had finished paying for the land. Uh, we heard Helen this morning saying, you know, um, even though she has no proof of that, that with the amount of money that was made on Pinnacle and the amount of money that was in circulation, it might have been paid from Howell to Chang directly and so that there was no title. What are your own thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, I appreciate what Ellen Lee is trying to do, you see, but writing a novel and giving her a context history are two different things. Mm-hmm. And I think that she has been misled, like previous researchers, from people who claim to know about Leonard P. Howell and what he has done. In the same way in which the researchers in the 1950s and 1960s were misled by Rastafarians about who is the prophet of the Rastafarian movement. Mm-hmm. It was only researchers. Yes. So, so we must be very careful now, looking at the history of Pinnacle mm-hmm. and what was really happening. Well, let me say this to you, Andrew. Yes. 1998, I, there are three men that influenced my life in, in, in Jamaica. One is Paul Vogel. The next one is Michael Manley, and the other one is Leonard P. Oil. Yes. But I found Bogle 1966 when I started high school. Um, Manley in 1970s. And in the 18 and 90s, while studying in New York, I encountered Leonard P. Oil. Mm-hmm. In the research center, I remember being at the research institute for the study of man, met Barry Chevan. And at that time, I was just joking about this thing, saying, look, man, there's this great man that I come across and stuff like that, blah, blah, and we spoke about this thing. I wonder if that, I might did, have been, wonder if that might have been why um, the, we're seeing in different books that we're reading and different papers that Barry Chavans had, did try to speak with Leonard Howard, but he refused to speak with him. Do you know about this? Barry Chavans? Yeah, that's what I, I, well, read, <laughs> I read somewhere. I yes. don't know if yes. they were around at the same time. Yes. Well, he died in 1980, you know, in 1981. Well, still in 1970s, though. Yes. Barry was more into the double PJ thing than into the spirituality, if I can recall. Yes. But I do not know about that well, kind yes, of Yes, well, it was just, just an aside because uh, his name came up yes. and I said, okay, wow, so he would have had some interest in Leonard Howell. And as a researcher, and Howell didn't die until 81. And we wondered right. why we didn't hear much more from him. So, so, so in the interest of time, Louis, um, yes. tell, give us your, 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 your take and, and what your research has shown in terms well, of... What happened by about yeah. 1945, you see? Oh, we like bought the place that was in some kind of, um, it was in bankruptcy yeah. from Lake and Nunes, a law company downtown. Good? Yeah. But he was, he did not finish pay off for the land, so to speak. And when we're talking about ownership and this kind of thing, you must have some documents, right? Yes. So in 1945, the bailiffs, you know, from Lake and Nunes took police and, and, and pushed the people off the land in Pinnacle. Yes, Lake, so and, the, lake and Newness. Do we know if it's the same lake family or it's a different lake? Well, it could be different, you know. I, okay. don't, I just want to look at the kind of yes. ownership thing yes. and yes. stuff like yes. that, right? Yes. It could be. Mm-hmm. And probably these here, I mean, you know the name gone slavery in this country. Yeah, right? well, yes. All right, but, so, yes. But, but what we saw was that there was this collaboration between this lawyer company and the police and the newspaper at the time. The newspaper, in fact, they drove in the same car to get the people off the land. The people went back in 1954. No, police can't come and raid you, you see. But police can raid you and mash up the things and run you off of the land. Mm-hmm. The police run you off of the land, it is like your land. Mm-hmm. And we want to get the anecdotal evidence out of the way. Yes. So, so we live in Tredega Park from 1956, I think, until he died. No, I think well, he died. I know did he, I did he, did he never he... put on any struggle to reclaim what people are talking about today in terms of taking away from them. Mm-hmm. The truth about it, Rastafari has no ownership to Pinnacle. They were never occupying Pinnacle at any time at all. One Rasta Bridging can make claim on his Rasta Lion when I met him around the same time. And I said, Rasta. We need to capture Pinnacle so we can begin some discussion. And that was going good. And what year was and that? 
Um, it is just about some time before we met and started the campaign. Okay, 2006-2007. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Rasta Lion lives um, in there. Yeah. I am saying to you that it was the Ethiopian Salvation Society, a benevolent society formed by Owila Fuchi, who was the president. And it's all the legacy today and all of his family and the, and the, and the Owil Foundation. Mm -hmm. But there are members of the Owil Foundation who have made the serious error by creating alliances with certain sectors of the rest of our movement. And we see what is happening now. I'm saying... All right, but, 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 but uh, let me ask you a question on this, Louis, yes. because I would think, um, and I understand what you're saying from a legal perspective, but, but in terms of the spiritual perspective, wouldn't Rastafari, uh, just as you, you said to, I, to, to, to Rasta Lion, but then have an interest... Uh, in Pinnacle, even from that perspective. Okay, good. The interest can only come this way. Yeah. And if the interest was there, I want to find out why between 1954 and now, is no Rastafari I just develop an interest in Pinnacle. Yes. Why? Yes. Why from 2007 and now, it is this kind of trust that is there. A national heritage site. Is a discussion between whoever own the land or government and nobody else. Yes. What can take place down the road is that you can meet with people who have interest and say, how do we define and describe this national heritage site? So you're making, you're making a distinction, Louis, between yes. the claim that Rastafari is now making on the land, that the land belongs to them because Howell bought it, and the fact that from a spiritual perspective, Pinnacle is a sort of a mecca, uh, as, as Clinton Hutton called it, the geographic faculty of Rastafari. Um, that, that from that understanding, heritage site and so on, that's a conversation that, should be, that Rastas should be having, or that, 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 is, that, that is worthy in this consideration. Um, all the elements that we have, that we know. All right, there can be several heritage sites of Rasta. There can yes. be Trinkyville, there can be Portman, yes, Pinnacle. I'm saying that when it comes down to people's land, Rastafari has no claim to the land. Who has a claim to the land? Who has a claim to the land is who can show the title for the land. All right. what, what, if, what if an injustice happened way back at the point of Chang? Let us let there us just say what this is that happening, you see. There right. are not. Yes. When you look at how many times that Owen was really arrested and stuff like that. Yes. As a leader of a commune. Because we are talking about having significant business between Kingston and Pinnacle. Pinnacle was a site of industrial and all of this kind of thing. But they have been asked to destabilize Pinnacle even just when they went there. The health department, the board of education, the parish council, everyone the, 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 the people who are their land that joined into Pinnacle and stuff like that, that was the, the, that kind of thing was going on in which there was this thing not to have Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the role of the law, it has been a struggle. I understand the sentiments, but sentiments we can use it and fight anything. But how do you... I correct, but, 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 but Louis... You cannot clear how, what is not yours. No, but how do you correct an injustice? I know you said tightly there has to be a title. But, but, but we know what... We know even to this day people are buying land in Jamaica and not getting any title. My sister is in that position right now um, with lands bought in Runaway Bay. I am asking, Andrea, I am asking you, Louis, uh, how do you correct... What's the most intelligent person? Who? Leonard P. Owen. Yes. Leonard P. Owen. After 1944, when the people said, look, the thing was not paid for, I suspect the same collaboration that took place between the British and Bustamante regime. Mm -hmm. And the private sector came into it, and this is how they got off the land. And you, and you, will, you, not, and you will not consider... Thing, you cannot read a man... And beat him and take him off from our land. Right. So, so, so the point you're making then regarding that is yes. that even regardless of all of that, the fact that there is no title. So, 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 so Louis, why... It's this, not just about no title, you know. The land yes. was bought in the Ethiopian Salvation Society, you know. A benevolent society under which oil was a president. Yes. It was not an open Rastafari organization. Because by then, several branches of Rastafari, right, started to emerge in the West. Good? 
-hmm. So we have to be careful when we talk, even if there was some claim for ownership, it would have to come through the Ethiopian Salvation Society. What do we know about the Ethiopian Salvation Society today? Well, I thought that the inheritors of the Ethiopian Salvation Society would naturally be the oil family, and um, but not so much the oil foundation, because I believe that the problems that we're facing with Pinnacle today, right? These problems are associated with members of the Oil Foundation. People who start to use the foundation to advance their own power. Never since they talk about ships coming to care of people in Africa, and there's a, a coffin with drunk on it, in terms of rumors that I see another rumor runs your right when people organize themselves. Let me talk about black history and black activities in this country, man. When last we Rastafarian, Black Jamaicans get together and deal with things that are really serious and that we can all, all and produce the evidence and fight and stuff. All right, what so would you suggest? What, what? People who are dealing with this out of sheer self-interest and to advance their own struggles in terms of leadership of the rest of our movement. And I'm sure that Jerry, while he might not agree with me on a lot of the things I'm saying, he would agree with me with this. And that is Jerry Small? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Um, the, 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 all right. What would be your, uh, you have done the research. You have been doing this research from your boy, literally speaking, as a teenager, as a young man uh, in, 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 um, in university. What yeah. would be looking at everything you have, hearing everything you're hearing, seeing the activism and, and, and hearing what, 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 what all parties are saying. If you were to advise this, all these myriad groups of people on how to move on this, bearing in mind every different element of, of the conversation, what would your advice be? Andrea? It was the same advice that I discussed with you in 2007. Yes. But it's on the basis of my work. I remember writing an article named something like the catalyst on Iraq, looking at oil and pinnacle. Oil as the catalyst and pinnacle, the rock in terms of the crucible of the Rastafari movement and, and, and reggae music and all of this cultural development in Jamaica. And that what we need to do is to have this place as a national heritage site. I am saying that it is the same thing that I say today. What people are lobbying for today is fighting for Rasta land, which never exists. What? Never exists. I agree. Then tell me this now. It has take you nearly 60 years to find out so that you have a place that is your spiritual center, that you never fought for it yet. And all the forces that have been working on it to make it become a reality is, is, is not you. The history of Rastafari movement in this country it is something that we must take seriously. And it is something that many Rastafari and move people out of their own self-interest have made obscure. It wasn't the researcher who said that Gavi was a prophet of the movement. It was Rastafarian people in Western Kingston how it was neglected. Mm -hmm. Not one of these people you hear talking about struggling for pinnacle have any picture of oil in the mansion and keep anything to celebrate anything about oil. And if this is so, and I know it is so, then it can only be out of self-interest that they are doing what they are doing for. Yes, and I, I was reading Barbara Blake's, um, Barbara Blake's book again on Rastafari, the new creation, where she named... Um, the, uh, the, the the people who were around at the time who were, were were you know simultaneously founders in terms of the message that they were to they, they were preaching about Rastafari like Hibbert and Dunkley and Hines and so on and so on and I'm saying that what this does though for us now is that um, yes here we're talking about Leonard Howell I think even for the youths and the young people and even the elders who are now talking about access to Pinnacle and, and reclaiming Pinnacle that there needs to be a, 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 at the same time a, an education process an ongoing education process on who Leonard Howell was what happened at Pinnacle who were at Pinnacle what was happening in Jamaica the social conditions at the time what was happening in Panama and so on who were the relevant um, you know Pan-Africanists and black leaders and so on who were active at the time to get a better Very understanding of, of, of what's happening but at the same time should we um, ignore um, Pinnacle as a site as a place, as a mecca 
uh, for 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 um, Rastafari, the geographic faculty of Rastafari. I love that term. Yeah, I am not. I am not advocating any kind of ignoring because from the per- first time I was there saying we need to establish this thing. Right now, there's an exhibition at the Institute of Jamaica and Rasta and oh, it's not in it. 21st century. Endorsed by some of the same people who are jumping around. I agree with you. But I'm saying that this is not about how I'm saying right now. Yes, what is it about? This is about people advancing their own self-interest right now. But because when we talk about heritage sites, I think we discussed the last time, yes. that we need to sit down and discuss now what is our heritage site. Yes. These kind of things we don't have because we might not be mature in this whole question of practically recognizing history and all of this kind yes. of thing. Well, these are the we top, see, but, but you yes, recognize... Yes, the home of Buster, Norman Manley, yes. and so forth. They become natural heritage sites and yes. all of this kind of thing. How do we develop heritage sites? To yes. recognize Leonard P. Owen, the founder of the movement, and Pinnacle as the rock from which the movement sprang. Louis, well, there's an ongoing conversation, as you know, and you also have said some really serious light on this. I think these are, uh, we, we must pay attention to what you're saying. We must listen closely to what you have said here and, 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 and to, to let, let, let what you have said direct how we move on. And, and especially to the younger people, I'm saying this because we could, the, the, uh, mistakes can be made. In in the exuberance and it's fine we love the exuberance we love the activism it is needed right now it's uh, so much is coming out of this even outside of pinnacle but at the same time there are issues to consider and and this must be done in rational in, uh, ways and and in terms of um uh, how how we move forward one of the things that we need to do as as louis has said is to understand who leonard howell is is to understand pinnacle thank you thank you louis well, 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 all right Okay, uh, Louis Moist and there. <laughs> All right, there's a lot to be said. These are people who have done the research, at least some research. Um, Louis Moiston has been doing the research forever. We heard last week from Clinton Hutton speaking with Professor Vereen Shepherd. We're hearing this morning uh, from Helen Lee and, and Louis Moiston. Now, in 2007, Minister Babsy Grange was the... She's now opposition um, minister, a spokesperson on culture, youth and gender affairs. She was a minister of culture at the time, and the culture ministry was integrally involved in identifying the, the lots at Pinnacle in saying, you know, what should be happen? We're going to go to speak to her right after this. Our Heritage Trust, uh, we went in search of Leonard Howell in 2007 at the time. Uh, one of the things that we um, had to do was to have conversations with the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, the minister. Minister of, of Culture at the time was Olivia Babsey Grange, and she joins me on the phone lines because we want to find out much more about how they did it, what they did, and so on. Minister, former Minister Grange, thank you very much Hi. for joining. Morning, Andre. How are you this morning? I'm, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. All right. So um, I'm sure you must have heard this ongoing conversation now about Pinnacle. You must be scratching your head and saying, but did we make about five or six large uh, heritage um, sites? Uh, what's happening? Uh, tell, tell, tell me what, what, what you know of, of uh, what the ministry did uh, in terms of the heritage sites at Pinnacle. Hello? Yes, are you hearing me, Babsy? Yes, I'm here. I'm All right, here. yes, you can right. Hear me okay? right. I'm hearing yes. you fine. I'm asking you, mm-hmm. w- under the JLP government, a lot was done in terms of Pinnacle. Uh, give us an idea of what was done. First, it was moved to the office of the Prime Minister. I know that. But give us an idea of what you did, what the ministry did in terms of making Pinnacle and some of the lots at Pinnacle a national heritage site. Well, I must tell you, I'm very disappointed that this controversy is going on at this time and in fact it's almost like we're in reverse because this is a matter for government of course the the dialogue started and was started i think in 2001 yes. and um, when an approach was made to the jnhd and when i took over as minister in 2007 we tried to to expedite the whole process. Mm-hmm. Now, we had gotten to the point where we had agreed on five lots, uh, that those five lots would be declared, 
that government would purchase those from the the owners of the property, in quotes, because, you know, there is this controversy about who really owns the land. But we're not getting into that. We weren't getting into that. We were getting into the fact that Pinnacle has an intangible heritage value because of its history, um, with Leonard Howell being the founder of the Rastafarian movement, and the fact that that property has been utilized, has been part of the whole religious and traditional activities for Rastas over 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the decision was taken that five lots would be declared, and that was lots 198, 199, 2001, lots 200 and 294. And this is after several visits. On one occasion, Mr. Golden visited the site, myself and Mr. Golden. And in fact, while we were there, we saw streams of visitors from overseas being taken on tours by individuals. Yes. It's a fantastic site um, where the Great House is located. The, the environment is so calming and wonderful. And we felt it was important that as government, we acted on it. Now, we weren't going to be declaring the land and purchasing those lots in order for government to run it as such. It was a, a um, dialogue between the Howell Foundation, the Howell family, and the Millennium Council. In fact, the Millennium Council prepared a very comprehensive proposal as to how the, the lots there could be developed and be utilized in, in promoting Rasta as a culture, Rasta as a people, and our government could ensure that we preserve the integrity of the site. So, um, initially, mm -hmm. uh, the Millennium Council had some objection when, in fact, when we serve notice when the notice of intention was placed in the daily gleaner this was like april 23 2009 the millennium council was the only formal objection lodged and they lodged the objection because they said that they were excluded somewhat from the process and also that they were concerned that the declaration would compromise the right of the Rastafari community to utilize the land for their sustainable economic development and the practice of their religion on the land as they had traditionally done for 50 years. Um, I asked the Jamaica National Heritage Trust to continue the discussions with them and the Howell Foundation and try to get them all to agree. They finally agreed. A visit was made to the site. Uh, the Millennium Council, the Howell family, and the JNHT. And they agreed on lots 198, 199, 201, 200, and 294. Five lots, which total approximately 50 acres of land. And the government at the other day under um, then Prime Minister Bruce Golding, had, yes. had identified these lots and said that they and, and had made the funds available. Were the funds identified to purchase these lots? Well, you know, there, there is a process once you, you decide that you would do that. In fact, yes. the owners, quote-unquote, of the land yes. had agreed that they would sell um, the lots to the government but once the once we had gotten the the disagreement between the millennium council and the the other parties once we had solved that the owners of the land now decided that they now were going to object mm -hmm. and would agree to only the lot on which the house um the remains of the house. I think that's lot 199. Yes. So we ended up now in a stalemate. However, you know, government, why I say this is a matter for government? Yes. 
government is in continuum, continuum. And it's not the visible in segments of party in power. So the fact that we started the process, this government has a responsibility to continue that process. Is this information, and, is this information that you just laid out for us available uh, for the government of the day today? Of course, it is um, in the records at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. I don't think they have seen it. They, yes, they have. It is there because what has happened is, from my information, the board, the new board of the JNHT in May decided to proceed only with lot 199, which is the lot that the owners have decided that's the only lot that will be made available. That can be declared. But we see, we, but we see a conflict there, you know, uh, former minister, uh, because, and it's, it's news time, so I'm so sorry, because the vice chair of the board is Michael Lake. Uh, and, and so how that decision was taken, I think, has to be, has to be looked at. Um, well, I, I see it definitely as a conflict. In fact, I think that um, anyone who is connected to this issue should actually resign from the board. It is a conflict of interest. The, 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 the Prime Minister had moved this issue to the office of the Prime Minister and there was no conflict at the time. He noticed that there was a, he noted uh, and that we're talking about There is a conflict because the, the, the issue and the discussions. Yes. Saying that it was moved yeah. to the office of the Prime Minister is, yeah. is really, doesn't make sense because okay. the Prime Minister under Mr. Golding, the Prime Minister. Yes. Yeah. Prime Minister Bruce Golding was always involved in, this, in the discussion. Oh, I see what you mean. But, but, the, but, Jamaica, but, no, but the Jamaica National Heritage Trust yes. falls under the Ministry of Culture, right. which has responsibility to do the declaration to our plan was that the Heritage Trust, working in collaboration with the Institute of Jamaica, the Howell Foundation, the Millennium Council, the Rastafarian community, would now come together and agree on the development plan and the way going forward once the lots were acquired by government. This government can acquire the lots by compulsory acquisition. Why, why is the opposition so silent until now? You've been silent until now. I think it's the first time we're hearing from the opposition on this, and especially from the Ministry of Culture, because our voices have been very loud. I'm talking about media, mine in particular, about the conflict that we see at the Ministry of Culture in terms of this issue being dealt with the Ministry of Culture today. What is the, the, the opposition's take on this, and why have you been silent for, for now? Well, for firstly, I, Andrea, you know that throughout my years, I have tried and ensured that culture would not become a political issue. I've always tried to ensure that culture and sports, we don't end up in a political divide and people taking sides. Yes. And so I've watched this thing develop. And what has really um, disappointed me is that the Ministry of Culture is treating this matter as if work was not done and that we had not come to an agreement and had taken this matter to a point where all that is needed now is for government to make a decision. This government to make a decision moving forward based on what we had done previously. And so I watched the thing evolve, and then I realized at this point that this matter is not going to be solved unless the facts are put out there and the public is not misled as they are being misled by the present administration. Uh, we're up on the news, um, Bamsis, but I, I just want to quickly ask, because I think this is very important, uh, for... for uh, the, the, the way forward in going ahead, do you think that this should, because, and this is not a cast any aspiration on anybody at all, you know, it is not a, a personally or otherwise, but do you think that there's a conflict in terms of the minister herself uh, and, and her 
a relationship, um, Miguel Loan called a sentimental and emotional relationship with Pinnacle, with the De- St. Jago Hills um, developers, that this that, that she should recuse herself, that she should, be, she should be taken from the Ministry of Culture or, I mean, uh, go to the Minister of Justice as, as the young people are asking the Rastafari Youth Initiative. Uh, what are your thoughts on this as, as, as somebody who's been uh, in the ministry, heading the ministry? Well, I, I think that all that is needed is for the Prime Minister to give the instructions, for, for the lots to be acquired through compulsory acquisition. I think that the deputy chairman sitting on that board is a conflict. I think that it is a conflict. I don't want to get in what sentimental personal relationships may exist wherever they exist. Yes. But government just needs to act in fact. I think that the 50 um, acres should be declared and acquired through compulsory acquisition. And then um, the government should look at acquiring maybe another 150 um, acres of that property and develop some kind of a a village. I mean, they acquire lands all the time. They have the Operation Pride lands that they acquire. They should acquire 150 acres and assist in developing a community where um, the Rastafarians can live and live in a decent, um, properly um, developed environment. There are many elders who I think would appreciate that. I've met with the elders and they need the kind of support that is given to any Jamaican and every Jamaican. Bob the Grange, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm so sorry because we're way over our news time, but you you have actually helped a whole lot here because we know that something happened. We know a decision was taken way back in 2007 and, 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 and wondered uh, you know, what happened to this? How did this change? Where was this now? And so what you have done is to put that in perspective for us. There is, I just want to say quickly, yes. there, is, there is one issue where um, how his wife's remains yes. are located. Yes. Um, there was that question as to exactly where. And her son, Monty, he says it's somewhere in the general area where the, the um, well is located. They can't say exactly where, but it is in that general area. And so I heard the director of culture saying, oh, we have to visit because we don't know where the grave is located and so on. There is a general idea where it's located. Right. And where the well is located is one of the lots that is being included in the five lots that are to be declared. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Babsy Grange, former okay. minister of Okay, thanks, Andrea. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, uh, way over news, but Hal Sheinberg, we apologize for the late start of news, but I'm sure you understand. We're going to go now to the local and international headlines with Hal Sheinberg. Uh, today, mm-hmm. the debate on the legalization of, of marijuana, because everybody's talking about it now. Uh, but in 1976, Peter Tosh released his first album, um, Legalize It. Legalize It. it. Uh, the man who was seeing far. Seeing far, far, far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a pity it has come down to this, but mm. um, time takes care of everything. It does, doesn't mm. it? Sometimes yeah. it's late, but um, yeah, it takes care of everything. Yeah, better late than never still. Better late than never. So let's see where that goes. All so, right. Anything else on your mind? Uh, no. All right. Okay. <laughs> Oh, good. All right. <laughs> you almost blanked, then, you know, if that is the case. Yes, yeah, I'm getting yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. All right. It's all roads, all roads leading to Westmoreland on the 23rd of February, the last Sunday in this month. We're going to be broadcasting live from the Peter Tosh Mausoleum as we once again in this Black History Month pay tribute to Peter Tosh. The theme this year is Legalize It. And the relevance of Peter Tosh to the debate on the legalization of marijuana. So all roads going to be leading to Westmoreland. By the way, we're taking the big bad shark wave. 
the big bad shark wave and we're going to put it down we're going to set it down in the big bad venue which is at the peter tosh mausoleum which dave and the brethren them ensure is a big 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 it extends all the way to the back and it goes to the front and to the side and you know so we're going to put the big bad uh, the big bad shark wave down in the yard man and we're going to be broadcasting live from 6 a.m. until about midday the phone lines and the strains of peter tosh in the background legalize it roger stephens joins us from california it must be about midnight in california good morning roger stephens <laughs> well it's actually 6 a.m. but the sun is still asleep uh, <laughs> good morning andrea how are you i am doing well how are you Oh good. I'm so happy that you're doing this for Peter. You know, Bob gets all the attention, but Peter was a vital part in bringing reggae to the world and I I'm so happy that the station is behind this. As a matter of fact, as you said that, I was watching a documentary in which you said if Bob Marley was Martin Luther King, Peter Tosh was Malcolm X or Che Guevara with a band. Explain that for yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I still stand by that. Yes, what do you mean by that? Well, Bob uh, made certain compromises in order to bring the message of Rastafari to the world and and Peter was a little less willing to make those compromises. Um Bob submitted to Blackwell's star-making machinery and uh, Peter preferred uh, his own version of militancy which turned off a lot of people. There was an African American music writer for example at the LA Times named Dennis Hunt who interviewed Peter I think in in 81 on the Wanted Dread and Alive tour who ended up saying that in print that he, he thought Peter was a madman <laughs> yes it takes a certain kind of madness i suppose uh to be as militant as that and and um uh, and to be as outspoken as that even when it is not on vogue to do so as we see yeah. with legalize it um legalize it has long served as an anthem for the legalization and in some cases a decriminalization campaign of marijuana and it's 38 years after Roger Stephens now we hear that Uruguay has become the first country to do so legalizing the growing the sale and the smoking of marijuana we see on January 1 Colorado legally uh, legalizing recreational use and uh, there are 20 states i think in, in the united states which have uh, legalized the use of the sale of marijuana for medical use uh when peter tosh was saying legalize it in 1976 and he was saying it before that but he had an album which uh you know was saying to the world this is what i stand for this is part of 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 the of 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 a, of a political stage and social stage that i'm taking this was not the the thing to do uh help us to understand what kind of 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 challenges peter tosh might have faced uh even in the 70s you know publicly saying or especially especially in the 70s and yes. uh you know we're just getting out of that whole nixonian age in 74 he was finally forced to retire for his utter corruption and two years later uh, peter is out there you know blowing herb in the in the face of the down pressers and doing it uh, with a great sense of humor too uh, can i tell you a little herb story yes please as long as well, it's worthy uh, for your play <laughs> uh, yeah no, no. In, in, in the it won't be that shocking yes uh, he had a marvelous publicist who had also worked for for bob uh um, a florid faced liverpool irishman named charlie comer who was hugely responsible for peter's international success mm-hmm. one of those behind the scenes persons that you rarely hear about and and charlie was kind of a, a dutch uncle to me too and an early mentor in my reggae career and he called me in september of 1979 and he says roger he says peter's in your town and he's got no herb <laughs> Can you help him out? <laughs> I said, well, as a matter of fact, I've just returned to LA from from Santa Cruz up in Northern California where a friend of mine had a a successful plantation and he gave us the a couple of tops to 16-foot plants, the colas, 
And uh, I said, I'd, I'd be delighted to help out the bush doctor. So we got one of the yes. colas, and my wife, Mary, wrapped it in beautiful paper and put a red, gold, and green ribbon around it, and off we went to the Sunset Marquee Hotel yes. in Hollywood, where he was staying. And we knock on his door, and he's got a chain on the door. And he opens the door a little, and he, and he sees me standing there with this huge thing in my hands. And he says, oh, what up? And I said, well, that's a gift to you, Bush doctor, from all the herbalists in <laughs> California. And he lets go of the chain. He grabs me, pulls me in, grabs my wife, pulls her in, slams the door, puts the chain back on, all in about, like, four or five seconds. <laughs> and I hand him the package, and he rips the paper off. And his eyes get big, and he... He looks at this, and he, he breaks a piece off, and he smells it, and then he looks down the barrel of it, and finally he turns <laughs> to me and he says, Shaw, take a whole lot more than this to get my propeller spin. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't give yes. it back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you know, right, one yeah, time he was in a hotel. Yes, yes. One time he was in a hotel... And he went out for lunch, and he came back, and he couldn't find his stash, so he called the police to report a robbery. <laughs> <laughs> no, Charlie had to go running down to the lobby to hold them off and said, no, no, there's been a mistake. <laughs> you know, Roger, you're not going to let me laugh this interview away, you know. <laughs> anyway, as much, as much as we love these stories, all right, but, 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 but what you have done is to bring Peter to life for, for so many of us, actually. And especially against the background of a theme in which we're heading to Westmoreland uh, for in terms of the, the tribute, the annual tribute to Peter Charge. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 glo the global debate, have you been following the, the, this global debate on the legalization and the decriminalization of marijuana? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you've mentioned it already, but yes. most of the Super Bowl teams come from the only two states that have legalized it. I love that. And I'm not sure you're aware of it, but yes. on Friday morning, the New York Times did an editorial urging the National Football League to reconsider their ban on marijuana. The New York Times. Oh, that's interesting. Peter no, would just be ecstatic, I think. Yes, I'm not seeing this. And this is interesting because even here in Jamaica, we're having that conversation. And granted, they, they have somehow, and I was talking about this last week, that they have somehow changed the word. So they're not again saying ganja, they're saying marijuana. Because, you know, in Jamaica, we say ganja for the most part. Um, so now, you know, when you hear the news, they talk about marijuana. They're no longer saying drugs. They're saying weed. Uh, and so you see the slight change in even the language. So if you deconstruct the language around marijuana now, you'll see that there is an acceptance among certain classes and certain segments of the Jamaican society, which I find very, very interesting because this is the same segment of a Jamaican society that uh, thrashed Peter Taj for, for, for his stance on marijuana. Uh, yeah, uh, now they sense the way they're going to make money out of it, so it changes. What do you think is the um, is, is different? I mean, in terms of what we're hearing now, the, the reasons are been given f uh, within the, the legalization debates, why it should be legalized, and, and what Peter Tosh said, what are, what are the similarities and the differences? Uh, are they just, you know, regurgitating what Peter was talking about all along, or are we seeing movement? Well, we, we know so much more about the beneficial effects of the herb. And uh, so many scientific studies have been done almost clandestinely because the government doesn't really approve of this in America, uh, in, in many of the states. Um, so there is an increasing body of knowledge that talks about the properties that, that can be helpful to a wide range of people, including the athletes uh, in, in the National Football League who are suffering from brain damage. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter always said it, it cured glaucoma. Uh, that was wishful thinking. And, and asthma and Perhaps so on. someday some derivative will be found to yeah. actually help glaucoma. Right. But I think they do have that now, don't they? Uh, I think developed right here from the minds of, 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 of some of our own Jamaican scientists. Um, oh, they, good. Yes. Um, but, but Peter also said that um, the, the marijuana had spiritual botanical agents, and I'm quoting him now, botanical agents. And he yes. said, and Jack, yeah. and Jack created it for the motivation of the mind. 
um, so that uh, and, and talk about how it's a violation of his constitutional rights to be to be humiliated, to be aggravated, and brutalized for for, for smoking ganja, and 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 then it was the 20th century. So so talk to us about this because it seems to me as if when you talk about medical marijuana. Um, he identified those without any scientific proof. Well, he understood intrinsically uh, what herb was, was capable of doing. And I think about Bob, too. You know, herb is a plant. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that famous quote. Yeah. Is, uh, alcohol make you drunk, herb make you meditate. And uh, Bob always told me when, I, when we talked about it that it, it, it was for education, mm-hmm. not for jollification. Mm-hmm. That you used mm-hmm. it as a tool to unite with the Almighty, I and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was something that allowed him to open the channels of communication to the higher power mm-hmm. and, and, and to let that wonderful inspiration come through. When I do my Life of Bob Marley shows around the world, there's always somebody who says, well, wasn't, wasn't he stoned all the time? And I say, look at all the incredible anthems that Bob and Peter wrote that people 30, 40 years later are singing all over the world in the outback of Australia, in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, in the peaks of the Himalayas. All of those were inspired by the use of herb. And at the millennium, Andrea, the New York Times said that Bob Marley was the most influential musician of the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first half, they said, was Louis Armstrong, both of them daily herb smokers. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the things that we, we, the, the title for this for this segment of the program is Peter Tosh's relevance to, to to the ongoing debate for the legalization. And know that I have a tendency to to beg for the question. My A level literature teacher always accuses me of that. Um, that you know, Andre, you're begging for the question because I tend to find something in something. <laughs> I find a name in something. <laughs> that, right. So, so 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 is this a beg? Is this a, a situation where we're begging for the question to say Peter is relevant to this conversation? Um, uh, and, and, and that we should identify him as being such? I think Peter was the most profound exponent for the re-legalization of herb that the world has ever seen. He was the bravest. He was uh, the most profound and uh, the most eloquent spokesperson for that with songs like Bush Doctor and Minago Jail for Ganja No More and, and then, of course, Legalize It, which is the, the hymn Mm-hmm. Of, of the movement. Um, I, I was blessed back in 2008 or nine. <laughs> yeah. It's early. I get older, it gets it's early in the morning. Warrior, yeah. But I, I think it was 2009 I was brought to Amsterdam to induct Peter Tosh as the latest member of High Times Cannabis Hall of Fame and uh, brought the, the message uh, to, to the people in Europe about what he had done in his life and and how important he was to an audience basically of people under 30 years of age, many Mm -hmm. of whom unfortunately weren't familiar with with Peter's work. And you can find that on YouTube Mm -hmm. if you put in uh, uh, my name and Peter's name and the Cannabis Cup, you'll you'll find that clip. Uh, I I must uh, say uh, with caution that uh, it was after four days of, of judging (laughs) <laughs> uh, 21 sativas and 64 uh, indicas uh, that I made my little talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a disclaimer. Or at least it's trying a, to. <laughs> it's a disclaimer. <laughs> that, it's a disclaimer that that we'll remember once we once we go to source it. All right. Yes, so, please. <laughs> so, so in so in essence, you're saying yes, he he is highly relevant to this ongoing conversation Absolutely. about the. But what about, what about the other issues that he identified? Because even though he talked about legalizing marijuana and pointing out the medical and the botanical agents and so on, um, that he talked about social issues. I mean, he talked about um, being humiliated, being aggravated, being brutalized. As a matter of fact, you know, he was beaten, uh, you know, thrown into prison after being arrested for smoking ganja, beaten for 90 minutes uh, and, and um, had to play dead, as he, as he tells it. Um, what about all of these issues, even as we talk about legalization and we see certain elements and certain segments of society um, weighing in on this conversation, 
putting the money behind this conversation, but yet you have the masses of the people in Jamaica, for example, um, Rastafarians and others uh, of the masses of Jamaicans who smoke ganja, who would, might have a spliff from time to time, who are still being aggravated and humiliated and brutalized uh, for smoking houses. What place do these social issues have in the conversation? Oh, I think they're very important because uh, marijuana prohibition has been used as a cudgel, much as tax laws in America were used to eliminate the mafioso. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't get them one way, get them another way. And uh, those laws are disgraceful laws. They never should have been passed. They were passed by a bunch of ignorant Puritans um, telling lies. Uh, in America, it was Harry Anslinger after Prohibition ended. He had all these government agents who were looking for work. So suddenly, marijuana, which had been given as medicines for, for many, many decades in, in the early stages of American history, were suddenly corruptors of youth, the most terrible drug, uh, reefer madness that movie that that is now played as a comedy yes, <laughs> yes whenever yes. anybody watches it's interesting it. yes uh, but people's lives were destroyed by this these draconian laws and and peter was one who constantly nattered about the necessity to get rid of these unjust and and truly hideous laws are we in danger of legalizing of decriminalizing but still haven't dealt with the cultural um, aspects I mean how the police force has been trained for example I've had conversations with police officers who you know tell you that I mean this is what we must do this is what we've been trained to do if, if we're standing at a certain part of the road and we see a young man with a spliff in his hand then we must do we must do something uh, you know are we in danger of, of going ahead with I mean, you know talking about how much money can be made from this a trade uh, uh, without dealing with some of these uh, cultural and social issues well those those laws have to be changed um, in, in fact uh, holder our uh, attorney general is now considering um, uh, suggesting that people who have been put away for herb in prison uh, be allowed out of prison early from their sentences because the laws are changing so rapidly in, in much of America. Uh, there's an awful lot of people who are doing serious hard time for smoking a spliff, uh, not even selling an ounce to somebody. And, and that, that's a terrible situation. And, and it particularly affects people of color in this country. There's a disproportionate amount of of black people in America and brown people being put in prison compared to the, the white people who smoke it just as much as anybody else. Roger, you, you're pretty close to, to Peter Tosh. You know him very well. And uh, you know, I asked this question of his son last week, Dave, and, um, and, and, and um, Warrell King. And you know, basically they said, listen, we, you know, we, we're not going to talk for Peter. <laughs> but um, tell me what you think about how he would, uh, how he would view um, the, 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 this ongoing conversation now and the extent to which it, it is happening. Uh, and I keep saying this in certain... Uh, because it, it almost has a classist ring to it, as if, you know, this conversation is, in a way, excluding the voices that, that should be heard, the voices that Peter Tosh would have reached out to even in his, in, his last, um, in his last days. What do you think his thoughts would have been on all of this? But it's taking far too darn long. Mm -hmm. I mean, Peter left us in 87. Seven, 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 that's what, 27 years ago, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's still being used, in, especially in, in the South in America and uh, France, for example, uh, has a terrible fear of herb and they, they crack down on, on people coming uh, across the borders from... Uh, Switzerland and, and Holland and places where there are laxer laws or, or no more laws against it and, and throw people in jail uh, for, for small amounts uh, and, and that would infuriate Peter. The, mm -hmm. the pace of reform has been slow and steady but not nearly as, as rapid as, as it should have been. 
uh, there's a whole lot more work to do, and, and we're going to we're going to face a lot of uh, resistance all along the way. There was a piece in the paper yesterday where uh, doctors were concerned that the edibles uh, were put into the hands of children. Well, they should be mm-hmm. much more concerned guns getting into the hands of children mm-hmm. and somebody mm-hmm. popping a little lollipop with some herb in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy that surrounds this. And, uh, you know, yeah. the oppressors love to control people's private lives. Uh, the Republicans, the Republicans in this country, those despicable people, the, the definition of an American Republican is someone who is terrified that somewhere someone may be having fun. And, uh, <laughs> those guys run the House of Representatives. Mm. It, it, it well, we we have we have a similar um, debate going on because I, I think we have you, you have to f- face a church in all of that and the, and the conservatives and so on. But it's an ongoing issue, so let us see where it leads. We're heading to West Milan on the twenty third, the weekend of the twenty third. We're there from Thursday uh, in tribute to. Peter Tosh. I know that uh, you might not be with us this time, but hope you'll be able to make it next year. I'm going to plan on it. Yeah, I yeah. had some other engagements uh, that I had already booked, so I wasn't able to make it this year. And, uh, it's a big year. It, it would have been Peter's 70th birthday this year. It, it was, he was such a wonderful man uh, and such an amusing man privately and and it's too bad that he he didn't let that particular face be shown too often when he was being filmed he he had that stern attitude most of the time when he was speaking publicly and uh, you know privately was was it was it you who was it you who said um, i can't recall but i know someone said it might have been you that he wore the dark glasses all the time to hide the twinkle in his eyes yeah <laughs> yeah that was me all right okay yeah. <laughs> that was fun. all right thank you very much roger stephens appreciate this oh uh, it's a joy to talk to you this morning andrea thank you so much for waking me up with such a delightful <laughs> conversation and give my best to elise and muda and everybody there at jamaica's great radio station will you Will do, will do. All right. Thank you very much, Roger Stephens. They are speaking live to us from California and uh, about the relevance of Peter Tosh to the conversation on the legalization of ganja. By the way, I know that today there is a... At the Jamaica Music Museum, that there is a forum at which uh, Dr. Omar Davies will be speaking. Dr. Davies was not scheduled to be on the program. I don't know if it's too early in the morning uh, to get him, but if my producer just come quick right here, we'll just try and get Dr. Davies online because I would like um, just to ask him about his presentation today. He's, the presentation is going to be making, what time and, and, and so on, uh, because that's happening today, and I think it's going to be a brilliant one because of the 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 um the subject matter that Dr. Davies will be zooming in on today. So we'd like to talk to Dr. Davies, if you don't mind, Joy. Just one come quick. Let me uh, give you a contact. So we need, uh, and if Dr. Davies, if you're hearing us, uh, we can. You can also give us a call. But anyway, we're going to try and get you right now uh, online to have a quick chat with you about the. Um, event today at the Jamaica Music Museum. Herbie Miller is arranging all of that. Uh, Dr. Davies is presenting and we'd like to talk to him quickly about what uh, his presentation will. Says he's not a politician but he suffers the consequences. At the One Love Peace concert you'll remember that Peter Tush demanded that officials legalize marijuana. He used his music for social change. Peter Tosh was beaten by seven policemen with batons for 90 minutes for smoking marijuana. We hear that it was for something else. There is speculation that it might have been because of the challenge that he gave to the authorities at the One Love Peace concert that that happened. Dr. Davies online and we're very, very happy that he could join us. Dr. Davies, I'm sorry to have woken you up so early in the morning, but thanks for joining us. Um, no, I, I, mean, I was awake at 4 30 this morning, so I am. Oh, you've been up. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Because I know that today you're going to be presenting uh, a paper at the Jamaica Music Museum. And because we're talking about Peter Tosh, we just spoke with Roger Stephens, uh, it clicked that, oh, yeah, but this is happening today. Let's put this in. All right. So, okay. so, so and I like uh, Dr. Davis, um, the, 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 
topic of your of your of your talk today. So first of all, tell us where you're going with this, uh, what the topic is, and how you're going to be. Uh... Well, am I, am I going to present it? Yes. Well, um, let, let me start with that one. Um, yes. um, well, uh, since I'm talking about songs, songs of praise and worship, and so on, it's not just going to, going to be a uh, an or, oral presentation. I'm actually going to play um, snippets of the various songs to which I refer. Yes. Um, so it's I, well. I think it's going to be quite an interesting presentation. Right. Um, from that perspective. All right. We've jumped. We've jumped in in the middle. Uh, and the songs. The the, the the topic of of a lecture today is going to be what? Oh, it's it's called. Um, Song, um, worship songs of life in, in, in life and at death and um, essentially I've looked at, at the, the way several Christian hymns or, or several Christian but one in particular um, farther along yes. how it deals with, with um, questions we pose in life mm-hmm. and it's by the way farther along is perhaps one of the most popular songs um, religious songs, song in churches, um, particularly at um, at in funerals. Right. And the, 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 the essentially what that what, what that song says is um, that so many complicated questions and they'll all be answered. Uh, quote farther along, which yes. is at death or after death. Mm-hmm. The great revelation will take place. And then in a, way they, um, in a way, it gives hope, doesn't it? It's like you might be suffering here, but farther down the road, when you go into heaven, it will be... Yes, yeah. yeah, yes. yes. But um, yes. I always... It, it's sung a lot in my yeah. funerals and my, my constituency and all that. Yes. And, but I used to leave depressed. Because <laughs> Sorry. It, it, not because of the death, but because what you go saying to the, the congregation is... Yes. Um, suffer, but don't worry. In the afterlife, things will be better. Yes, yes. And I would go, I'd go home, and then I would partly to cheer myself up because I would I would say, but this 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 is a very strange way to to speak to a living congregation. Mm-hmm. Um, that the, the only your only hope of uh, a relief from despair is is after death. Yes. And um, I, I would listen to what is actually my favorite Peter Tosh um, song. It's called Just Say No. Mm-hmm. And you should, you should play it. I have it, it queued up. I have it queued up. Uh, so, but, yes. I mean, and, and there's a particular yes. um, verse. It, I mean, what, what, what was fascinating is that someone would take um, a philosophy about, uh, about theology and package it so attractively. Yes. But my favorite verse is you never give I and I more than I can bear. Um it, it, it's 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 the, the sentiments are not original. They're actually from the the, the Bible. But we are son so um is a pity I won't queue up farther along because it speaks about I don't play those I don't I don't play those kinds of songs. <laughs> <laughs> About well, actually, it speaks about it speaks about um, well, yes. it should, what it should, what song we should play. There's, yes. a, there's, a, there's a good Jamaican version by George Banton, okay. which I reuse. Yeah. I'm going to ask Big A to play it when he comes in after me. So Big A, cue up right. along. Yes, he's going to really. George, yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but yes. let him play it by George Banton. George Banton. Yes. He's, a, he's a Jamaican. He's a Jamaican singer. Okay, great. And yes. anyway, so I would I would go home and then I would play that because. Mm-hmm. It is a totally different message. Yes. It tells you why you should be positive, etc., and um, gives you, um, tells you that in, in whatever the tribulations, and then um, Jai is looking out for you. But my, my, my particular thing, which has been a source of inspiration to for me, well, right through life, and because I, I also listen to it all along, I listen to a lot of. Of um, Jamaican music, uh, but my particular, my favorite thing is the reassurance that regardless of how uh, serious the tribulation, you know, more than all right, we seem to be losing you a bit there, Doctor Davies. Yes. All right, great, great, I, I, you're back. Yes. Yeah. 
So I, what I started doing is to say is to deconstruct both songs verse by verse yes. and, and pull out themes and say this is what Father Along, which is one of the is a very, very popular um, Christian hymn. Of course. What it, it, this is what it says to you. Mm-hmm. And this is how Tosh um, responds on the virtually same right. themes. That, now, I'm not suggesting that Tosh was trying to, to, to put a counter to mm-hmm. Father Along, mm-hmm. but it, 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 for me, it was. Yes, and it's good to make that comparative study because I didn't even think of it. But when I saw um, the the paper, which 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 I had a chance to look at, the one that the, the published paper which you sent, I thought, uh-huh. wow, this is brilliant because I hadn't even thought of it. And these are two songs uh-huh. that I personally love, uh, honestly. Uh-huh. And you know, Father Along is a song that my mother sings all yeah. the time, and yeah. Peter Tosh is one I just listen to all the time. Yeah, just out of interest, did she? Did, um, when I, I first, I, this is a variation on a paper I presented a year ago. Yes. And Ronnie Fritz told me that he was glad to have come because he thought the title, according to the song sung by his, 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 um, the people in his congregation, yeah. was Father, Father alone. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> yeah, so I just I just also which, which I learned I didn't I didn't know before and the more I've spoken to now I've I've gone to subsequent funerals and listened closely. Yes. I, and that's what they actually say. So it is true. They, they have, in a sense, written their own song without, 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 without recognizing. Without, without, without recognizing. Yes. Anyway, so I, I use that, I developed from that, uh, because, uh, as I said, that the lyrics to Just Says No had always been very inspirational to me. And I, and I, and I use that to develop, um, I, I, I would think, a more generic question as, how does one religion, uh, one religious viewpoint, view what you face in life as opposed to an, another? And I also make the point that um, most most of us have come to, would accept Father alone as a religious song, but there are, there are very, very few persons who would, uh, would, 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 who would see just say no as expressed in a theological viewpoint. All right, we're not going to let you talk out too much because we want the, we want people, listeners, to be at the lecture today because you're speaking okay. today, later on yes. this afternoon. Uh, yes. Where are you speaking, at, Dr. Davies? At the Institute's auditorium, at the Institute of Jamaica's auditorium. And um, I think I go on at, I go on at 2. Harold Miller assures me promptly. That you'll be on, on at 2 o'clock on. promptly. And you, you'll be playing music, you'll be playing the, the songs, because it is what it is, so you'll be, the audio will be there. People will be able to, uh, to, to listen as you, give the, as you present the paper, give a lecture. Yes. All yes. right. Well, this is oh. brilliant. Dr. Davies, by the way, is part of our team. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of our team. As we, ce- yes. as we celebrate... Yes. A late, a late <laughs> as we celebrate and pay tribute to Peter Tosh, so we'll hear much more from you. We know you were ill uh, recently. How are you feeling now? I'm, 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 I'm fine. This will be my, really my first time. Um, although I've been going to office, Yes. this will be my first time. Um, public uh, uh, appearance in a couple of months, you know. Okay. But then I've come, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it's, I'm just recuperating with a physiotherapist now. All right, and okay, so, brilliant, brilliant. So uh, more health and more strength. And I uh, hope everyone turns out later on to the Institute of Jamaica's auditorium. Uh, 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 sorry, you're going to miss it. Yeah, it's because it is, it, it, I'm, I don't have to miss it, you know, because if I hit, hit the road immediately, but let us see. Our king is on the line. Warrior, good morning. Greetings and give thanks. Greetings, my brother. I know you were in the studio last week, and you say we we'll save it this week. We said no. Let us put Warrell on the phone, <laughs> so he doesn't have to drive from Westmoreland. But Warrell, yes. you know, um, there have there have been developments even since we spoke last week in terms of the big, big celebrations uh, for Peter Tosh, a tribute to Peter Tosh in Westmoreland. Tell us what's a new uh, development. Did I hear you say Peter Tosh? No, I must correct you, dear. Remember now, it's the Honorable Winston <laughs> Mackintosh O.M. O.M., please. Yeah, but because, I'm, because I'm saying I want no title from them, you know what I mean? <laughs> my God, man, isn't that an achievement? Yeah, yeah man, I, I, remember, I remember we campaigned for it still for him, you know, but it's just for sure them so they must do it, you understand? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll do it late. It's yeah. better late than never, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. My heart is great. The bottom line is that the most critical thinking Jamaicans have long agreed that our political parties have failed us. 
and many are slowly coming to the awareness that our unions are now betraying us, even as they sell us and barter our rights to the very political parties which have long failed us. We're looking at acts of betrayal from our unions coming from uh, uh, areas in which a demand for reciprocal act of sacrifice from parliamentarians have not been made, where union bosses have forced workers to agree to a wicked, dehumanizing and cruel deal of wage freeze or wage restraint, as they euphemistically call it. And last week we talked about how successive Jamaican governments have engaged in corruption, in nepotism and greed of untold proportions, the level of which, uh, levels of which we shudder to even think of. And when they have drained their coffers and fattened themselves, they collude to sell us into enslavement again by signing our death warrant with IMF agreements and MOUs of which we ourselves have no understanding about, uh, which we are not consulted and to which we have given no consent. The bottom line is that this is a sordid state of affairs. Last week we said that social media had a place to play in all of this. The bottom line is that the kind of social movements which should have been emerging out of Jamaica in response to the betrayal of a people's trust, the oppression of the poor and the wanton overtaxation of Jamaicans have been stymied. And those that have been vanguards of equity and justice have been hijacked by fifth columnist spies and political cronies who pose as sympathizers and or genuine members only to effectively sabotage liberation movements and calls for equal rights and justice. The Garvey movement have been, has been hijacked by what Julius Nairi calls the African elite, probably the most dangerous to the liberation movement. The Rastafarian movement has been hijacked by politicians, government agents posing as sympathizers, by ego, by greed, by individualism, away from the collective and community focus upon which it was founded. The Pan-African movement has died a natural death, as Pan-Africanists are given prominent positions in political parties, in government, in academia, and civil society and human rights organizations are dependent on funding and genuflect to European and other funding agencies in the issues they highlight. And that is why we say the movements have been hijacked and we are left with a sordid state of affairs. The bottom line is that media is complicit in its lack of radicalism, in its fear of rebelliousness, and its, in its failure to generate and stimulate the kind of social movement upsurges that would critically question, not just underline, critically question governance and demand accountability. What do we mean by radical media? Using Downing's definition, it is media that expresses an alternative vision to hegemonic policies, priorities, and perspectives. Radical media exists not necessarily as an opposition to mainstream media, but fit into the realm of popular culture. The bottom line is that, but for a few individual media practitioners, the Jamaican media is no more than a prostitute sleeping with anyone who can sponsor, fund, and or keep its commercial base strong. In that way, the Jamaican media has become a significant part of a sordid affair as it stokes the ego of politicians, artists, advertisers, and agencies. The bottom line is that as, media, as a media practitioner, I am acutely aware of the power of the industry and the need for radical activism. And as Downing argues, rebellious communication, not just partisan activism, which is aimed at unseating politicians and nothing more, as was blatantly obvious in the efforts of some in the media to topple the Golden administration, most of whom have gone silent on the very issues they appear to have been genuinely concerned about. The bottom line is that many of these so-called media activists who, were, who we now know were merely PNP cronies, are now either senators, communication consultants, public relations officers for PNP ministers. And before there are any misunderstandings, this very same scenario was played out by the JLP media practitioners, who under the guise of objectivity, use a powerful platform of media in a bid to unseat Portia Simpson Miller and so on and so forth. It is what it is on either side. The bottom line...
for media practitioners to demand accountability first from ourselves, then from government ministers, political representatives, public sector workers, private sector, and so on, and to make justice and equity the principles upon which we approach our craft as media practitioners. Downing discusses the importance of both radical media and the mainstream media in the democratic processes. And he gives five reasons why radical media is necessary in a democratic society. We want to talk about them because he talked about radical media, which usually free of word and time limits placed on traditional media. And that is why we also need to own our own media. It's important for us as radical media practitioners to ensure that we have a spaces where we do not have these time limits and constraints placed up on us. This allows for more specialized and detailed coverage. This also leads to a proliferation of possible subject matter, so we can talk about what we want to talk about, focus on the social issues, focus on injustices, whereas traditional media is more or less constrained. But where we are in the spaces that we are, we must use those spaces, however constrained we find ourselves. So radical media can include the normally excluded. So this is where we raise our voices uh, for those who have been excluded. Raise our voices for those who have been marginalized. Downing says that this is particularly true to vulnerable, marginalized members of society. We need to ensure that as radical media practitioners, and radicalism is important, you know, especially in a situation where there's economic oppression, where there is social oppression and social injustice and inequities and exclusion. This is when radical journalism becomes very, very important. All right? Radical media can help developing and existing social movements. And this is what we see happening. We see this happening with uh, lots of movements. We won't name them right now. But uh, radical media's internal organization structures uh, are less hegemonic. This is another thing to bear in mind because ownership is also very important. Media activists and activists who, to misquote a sergeant for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, are concerned with the immediacy of total independence and unity, cannot be prepared to wait upon the evolution of history, but must be prepared to give history a revolutionary push. Media activism assumes that there is an interdependence between social movements and the media, that the role of the media, especially in a democracy, is more than just to report and entertain, but to be the fourth estate, more powerful than them all. Media activism understands the role of the media in revealing to ourselves, ourselves, in the role of media practitioners to be more than mere reporters, but to speak truth to power and to be impossible, to be bribed, to be paid off or to be silenced. Media activism is about truth and rights and justice, and media practitioners are challenged to be more than we have ever been. Where are we to look? What is our ultimate challenge? Where are we to look for our survival? The Emperor Haile Selassie says we must look into ourselves, into the depths of our soul. We must become something we have never been and for which our education and experience and environment have ill prepared us. We must become bigger and better than we have ever been. We must be more courageous. We must be greater in spirit, larger in outlook. We must become members of a new race, overcoming petty prejudices, owing our ultimate allegiance, not to nations but to our fellow men within the human community. Journalist for the masses of the people. I spoke directly to media this morning, and so the language was 